Co-Chair Wisniewski? Here. Co-Chair Weinberg? Here. Thank you. The committee calls William Pat Schuber. If you come to the desk, please, with your attorney. You, whichever you choose. The small black microphone is always on that is recording for the uh, record so if you have any discussion between the two of you that you cover that microphone up and this one you can turn off and on which is the amplification the one with the red button okay i'm sorry uh, you, you press the one with the red button for the amplification. Yeah, when your microphone is on, it will be lit. Okay. Uh, as you probably know, I'm Senator Loretta Weinberg, and this is my co-chair, Senator John Wesneski. We're co-chairs of the committee. Uh, you're accompanied by an attorney, and if so, may I ask the attorney to introduce himself? Attorney. Salvatore Alfano, 55 Washington Street, Bloomfield, New Jersey. Senator, um, Mr. Uh, Schuber has a short statement he would like to make before the proceedings begin. Uh, Mr. Schubert, do you understand that the statements you make to, if the statements you make today are willfully false, if you fail to answer a pertinent question or commit perjury, you may be subject to penalties under the law? I do. Did you receive a subpoena from this committee compelling your testimony on this meeting? I did. Do you understand that you have certain rights under the Code of Fair Procedure, including the right to be accompanied by your counsel? who shall be permitted to confer with you during your questioning, advise you of your rights, and submit proposed questions on your behalf? Uh, I do. Uh, as you can see, we have a hearing reporter here from the Office of Legislative Services. Your testimony is being recorded, and it may be transcribed for the committee, and, and it may be used in other proceedings. Do you understand that? I do. You are entitled to a copy of the transcript of your testimony at your expense when such copy is available. Do you understand that? I do. You have a right to file a brief sworn statement relevant to your testimony for the record at the conclusion of your examination. Do you understand that? I, I do. Uh, please note that all of your responses should be verbal. We obviously can't record a head shake or a nod if you don't understand a question, please ask for clarification. Otherwise, I'm going to assume that you do understand the question and that your answers are responsive to that question. Do you understand that? I do. Uh, before I proceed with the oath, do you have any questions? No, I do not. Okay, we'll do the oath and then you'll be uh, welcome to uh, read whatever statement you choose. Please stand, raise your right hand, Mr. Schuber, do you swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give is true, correct, and complete to the best of your information, knowledge, and belief? I do. Thank you very much. Please be seated and state your name for the record. Oh, uh, William uh, Pat Schuber, S-C-H-U-B-E-R. Thank you. Now you may go ahead. Um, Madam Chair. Uh wish to read a statement. Madam Chair, before the witness starts. If, I'm um, sorry. I, I do have one procedural question for our attorney before the witness begins. Um, several weeks ago during a comp... I'm really having a little problem. I have an ear problem this morning, so speak okay. up, please. Uh, several weeks ago on a conference call with, our, uh, with um, Mr. Shore, uh, we raised a question that we weren't sure whether or not it would be pertinent to Mr. Schuber coming in. We received yesterday afternoon the materials for today's hearing, which consisted of seven documents, which for the most part pertain to a, um, various communications 
between uh, the chair and Mr. Schuber. Um, question that we have for counsel is, in light of the fact that it appears as this witness has been called in for the main purpose of testifying as to those first-hand communications between the chair and Mr. Schuber, whether or not it's appropriate um, for the chair to be asking the questions of Mr. Schuber in light of the fact that it pertains to just direct communications between the two of you. And we, we your question for council assembly. Yeah, we posed this question Mr. a couple Sharp, of weeks ago, so nobody would be sandbagged. But I just um, we never had follow up, and based upon the materials we received last night, it appears that that's the main purpose of this witness today. I appreciate the question. Um, obviously, this is the first I am being uh, asked of. That. Actually, on, on the conference call, we specifically brought this up so that it, we would not be in a situation like this if, my, if my it was. My recollection call was not a request of me uh, in any way to provide an informed opinion and certainly not uh, on this morning. Nonetheless, um, given I am not intimate with the professional rules of conduct, um, I don't see that there is an actual conflict uh, in asking questions. Uh, it seems to me that if someone has a motion for recusal, that's something that can be made at the appropriate time. Um, if there is an appearance of conflict, that, again, from a legal perspective, is not one that would prohibit the questioning, but one the committee as a whole would have to consider uh, as to their view, and again, I would assume uh, provide any motions that would deem to be appropriate. However, I will tell you, uh, again, I recall the issue was generally raised, but I do not recall any specific request that research be done. So I'm providing you an answer limited by the fact uh, that I have not gone and done any particular review of the New Jersey Legislative Code in any particular way. So I would suspect that if you have a motion, um, I assume that would be entertained, but I don't see an inherent actual conflict uh, in asking questions uh, based on the history here. Does that answer your question, Assemblywoman? Uh, okay. Your statement, Mr. Schuber. Sorry. Thank you. <clears throat> Uh, members of the committee, um, just a very brief statement, if I might, uh, and thank you. I just want to state very emphatically that I have had no involvement in or prior knowledge of the decision which led to the lane closures at the George Washington Bridge, and I would never condone the use of governmental powers to exact political retribution. Such actions cannot be countenanced under any circumstances, and to the extent of the wrongdoers should be held accountable for their misconduct. That's it. Thank you very much. And do we, do we have a copy of his statement? Were we given a copy? No. Oh, I'm sorry, I brought it in my pocket. I'm sorry. You'll provide copies to oh, Sure, certainly, certainly. Thank you. Any other questions before I begin? <clears throat> okay, I actually don't have a lot of questions for you, uh, uh, Pat, uh, and uh, as you know, and uh, let me just kind of frame how, uh, how I look at, at this and then ask you some questions. Uh, I'm sure you're going to that you recall when you were nominated by the governor to uh, take a seat as commissioner on the Port Authority. And you and I had a conversation privately when you made your obligatory respectful call to me as uh, somebody gets sign off on you, as well as a member of the Judiciary Committee. And uh, then we, I had a public discussion about the very same thing when you came before the Judiciary Committee. And I recalled that same conversation in a letter I wrote to you back in August of 2011. 
That letter concerned the toll increases at the Port Authority, and I am not going to ask you any questions on that because other committee members are going to. But I just want to read, and the committee has copies of this letter, the opening sentence of that letter that I wrote to you in August of 2011, so that we can take this out of the realm if anybody thinks there are any personal issues. May we the, have a copy of the letter? Yeah, excuse me, the first sentence of the letter says, I know you will recall our conversation when you appeared before the Judiciary Committee for your appointment as one of New Jersey's commissioners on the Port Authority. I told you at the time I was delighted to support someone as a commissioner who is from Bergen County, who would represent our Bergen County votes, voices, and interests in the future. After your confirmation by the Senate Judiciary Committee and the New Jersey State Senate, I was secure in the knowledge that you would be looking out for Bergen County. And then the letter goes on to talk about the toll increases. And that was the reason that I reached out to you in a letter on September 19th after the issues of these lane closures were coming, uh, were, were printed in the press and I was getting calls from constituents. It's not because of anything personal. You and I have had, a, I've always thought, a rather amicable and respectful relationship over the years. But I reached out to you because you were the Bergen, what I thought was the Bergen County voice for our citizens. And I wrote you a letter on September 19th of 2013 asking a variety of questions about the lane closures. And I know that letter has been distributed to the committee and has been commented upon in the press. As I recall, you called me soon after, within a couple of days after you received that letter and my recollection of that conversation was that you said, and I believe you, believed you then, and I believe you now, that you had no knowledge of what took place in those lane closures, but that you were going to check and get back to me. That was my recollection of that phone conversation. So I just want to put that in perspective, lest anybody on this committee thinks Beyond the fact that I depend, depended upon Pat Schuber, whom I know and like and respect, to be a voice for Bergen County. That's why I wrote you the letter on September 19th. And I, I just have one <coughs> or two questions, and then I'm going to pass it on to our co-chair. Once you received the letter and you made that phone call to me, which I appreciated, and again, let me reiterate, I believed you then that you certainly had no knowledge that this had not come before the Board of Commissioners, and I believe you now in what you stated in your opening statement. I would like to know what you did and who you might have run that by after our phone conversation, which was held mid, mid to late September. Well, Senator, my recollection of our discussion was a little bit different, but let me say, suffice it to say this, that the, you had asked me at that time, there were a couple of things that came up during that, uh, that conversation. First of all, I had not received the letter um, directly, number one, and I, I had received a phone call that the letter had been received by the governor's office. The September 19th letter? That's correct. That's correct. Well, we sent it to both your private law firm as well as the Port Authority and faxed it to you. But, but it, it had not gotten to me. But it, suffice it to say, I, I did finally receive it. Um, and um, a couple of things. Uh, we had, that day, we talked about the toll increase. I think uh, we talked, if I recollect, about your late husband. We talked about the, the fact that I was concerned that Fort Lee had not received any notice with regard to whatever had gone on here. And I asked if you had my cell phone number, and you did not, or you couldn't find it, and I gave it to you, and I said, please call me if there's any future 
issues with regard to this. And I asked, is there anything I could do here? And you said, would you call the mayor of Fort Lee for me? And I did. Uh, when I hung the phone up that day, um, I called the mayor of Fort Lee. Um, and on, on the second go around, got him and had a conversation with him, too, at the same time. My concern at the time was, and again, this is at that time, uh, uh, before I had seen any of the rest of the stuff that came out much, much later, was that uh, my biggest concern with regard to anything we do is, is notification to the municipalities or uh, any of the organizations that might be impacted by any of our projects. And that was, that, that was my major concern. I think that's what I talked to you about at that particular time. So there, uh, the, it was the governor's office who called you about my letter? No, they no, no, no. They received it apparently before you did? No, no, the governor's office didn't call me. Oh, I, th I thought you said you had not seen my letter that... I, I had not, it had not come to me. I had received the letter that the governor's office had received the letter before I had. Okay, and how did you know the governor's office had received the letter before you did? Because I got a call from on the whatever, and I don't remember whatever the date was, but I got a call from Mr. Wildstein that said the governor's office had spoken to him, that a letter had come in directed to me with a copy to them and to several other people, I guess, that had dealt with the that was directed to me about the lane issues on the fort on the bridge at uh, at the George Washington Bridge. Okay. So you are only concerned, or the only concern, in spite of what I said in that letter, the only concern you gleaned from our conversation was that Fort Lee hadn't been notified, but there was nothing to be looked at in terms, uh, but beyond that, in terms of the lane closures. Well, two things. I, I should be, two things. One is the, the notification to the municipality has always been a sore spot for me, having been a local official. And I was really, uh, and, and I was annoyed with that. But second of all, I think too, was that I, 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 I really felt, and this is the way I felt about it, that you know the letter was directed to me personally. I'm one of six commissioners from New Jersey and, and 12 altogether. And I kind of took a little bit, I, I, quite frankly, I took that personally. That's the way I took it at the time. Well, it was directed to you personally. No, I understand very, that. I appreciate that. For the very that. reason I outlined, like my letter of 2011 was addressed to you personally. Yeah, no, no, but I'm also telling you that's how I felt about it, too, with regard to it. I certainly will uh, accept that as your feelings, and I'm sorry uh, that, the, that, that, that the idea of my voting for you and stating publicly at the Judiciary Committee meeting, and even telling you, if I remember on our early conversation, that I did not have to have a one-on-one -on -one interview with you. You didn't have to come to my office. You know, there were, uh, n n and none of that ceremonial or political stuff was on between us, but that I was really happy to have a Bergen County person who understood the problems of Bergen County on the Board of Commissioners. So I will accept how you felt about it, and I'm sorry that for whatever reason, in spite of what I said in both of these letters, that you somehow felt I shouldn't talk to you personally. But let me follow up. On October 6th, I, uh, 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 first of all, on October 1st or 2nd, Pat Foy's email was in the press. On October 6th, I appeared before a subcommittee that you chaired. Right of uh, governance and ethics, I think it was called, something like that. And again, courtesies were extended to me. I knew that the, there was no requirement to hear from the public, but I had come to the committee meeting and you extended the courtesy to me of appearing before the committee. And I again talked about now what were issues that were raised in the press issues that were raised by your executive director, Pat Foy, that had been in the press by that state, that laws were broken, that no processes were followed, et cetera. Did, did you, as part of a member of the Board of Commissioners or any other commissioner, do anything to follow up after that October 6th meeting? <clears throat> When the, the background on that was the, the meeting was being held in New Jersey for the first time. We were holding committee meetings in New Jersey in order to 
uh, hold, um, start to hold meetings on both sides of the By river. The way, it's a comment. It was more difficult getting there than it was getting to New York. There's no doubt there, about it. <laughs> There's no doubt about it, Senator. Um, and uh, the, um, so we, we were holding two meetings that day. One was the uh, Committee on Ethics and, and uh, uh, Governance, and the second one was the Security Committee meeting, which was going to be held right after, which <clears throat> I think I had seen uh, someplace, and I don't remember where I had seen that you, you wanted to come to that meeting to, to testify. And the, uh, the port has a rule that on committee hearings, the, the, the public doesn't get a chance to testify. But I had, having seen it in the paper that you were going to come, I had no problem with you uh, testifying it or, or making a statement there at all uh, with regard to that. I really didn't. It was, I, I thought it was only appropriate to be done as far as that goes. But I, I think I was concerned that, and it's been my concern throughout this, and I've wrestled with this consistently, uh, I guess up until the other emails came out at the end of December or January, which was this, this whole issue had become very, very, I thought, politically charged, quite frankly, or even partisan to a certain degree. And quite frankly, I, I, it was not something I wanted to be involved in the middle of, quite frankly. And that's the way I felt about it. Um, and uh, um, I, you know, I, I wanted to give you the opportunity to testify with regard to that so, so everybody else could, could hear about that. But that's how I felt with regard to it. Okay, so your feeling as the commissioner at this stage was because of the, I guess, political charges that your executive director made that none of your processes were followed and that laws were broken. Your feeling at that stage was because it was politically charged that you, you just didn't mm. want to be involved in it. Is that correct? No, that's not correct. I, I, I felt that it, it had nothing to do with Mr. Foyer at all, and I'm not even sure I had seen his statement at that point, quite frankly. Uh, but the, the fact of the matter is I felt that it, the, the nature of how this played out at that particular time became very, very, I thought, partisanly ch partisan charged. Um, it became somewhat political with regard to that. And, 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 and my position with regard to that, I just didn't want to be in the middle of that. Okay. And when I appeared at the full Board of Commissioner meeting in October, in November and in December, and uh, if you remember correctly, I did, I not only engaged you personally, I engaged every single New Jersey commissioner. Yes. I named each of you by name and the towns that you came from just to accentuate that you were each from New Jersey. Uh, so I, I want to clear that up too because not only you from Bergen County did I expect to hear some voice, but I expected to hear some voices from the commissioners from New Jersey. So when I appeared in October, November, and December uh, at one of the meetings accompanied by Assemblyman, uh, my co-chair, Assemblyman Lesneski, uh, my um, colleague from District 37, Assemblyman Johnson, none of us were there in, uh, in terms of Partisan, or is that how it's looked on? We were all there in terms, not to speak up on behalf of the residents we represent, but because we are partisan political people? I think that for my, and I, I can only speak for myself, uh, I can't speak for the other commissioners, quite frankly. Um, but I, the way this, the way this played out with regard to that, I looked at it in, in, a, in, a, in a partisan way. Um, with regard to that, I did, um, and I, and that's the way I felt about it. Um, and I just didn't want to be. I, I, I saw this very quickly becoming a f political football, and from my perspective, I just didn't want to be involved with that. It's not the reason I went on there to begin with. Not the reason you went on the Port Authority. Correct. Okay, and one, and I have one more question, and I'm going to pass it to my coach. Uh, what about Papua's email? Was that partisan politics? Or was that investigated by any member of the Port Authority? 
Well, I, 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 at the time that you mentioned it, I'm not sure that I had seen it, to be honest with you. Um, I, well, may have, I, I, just, I may have seen it afterwards. Um, okay. With regard to um, that, I, I can't answer that question because I just don't know. Um, I did nothing with Mr. Uh, Foy's uh, uh, email with regard to that afterwards. Um, the um, I think there may have been some uh, tension between some of the New Jersey permanent staffers and the and the New York staffers. So again, that was another issue that that played out with regard to that. And um, I, I just didn't want to be a part of that either. Thank you very much. I will pass this on to my co-chair. Thank you very much, Senator. Mr. Schubert, thank you for being here this morning. You're welcome. I wanted to go to um, perhaps the more fundamental issue of the Port Authority. Um, would you agree uh, that the perception of the Port Authority at this point in time is not at its highest? I, I suspect that's an understatement, but having said that, uh, although I, I, I believe by what I know they do beyond this issue, that it's a highly professional organization. Um, is the perception of it different today because of this and several other issues? I would agree with that. Would you agree that one of the issues that is often talked about with regard to the Port Authority is the issue of transparency? Yes, I would agree with that. I think that's an, an issue that the Port has wrestled with over the course of time, being a very traditional organization in many ways, a quasi a by state agency on top of that, um, and used to doing things in certain ways. Yeah, I would agree with that. What do you view your role as a commissioner at the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey to be? The. Um, as Simon Wisniewski, that's a very good question. Now, let me, if you'll give me just a minute to, to kind of respond on this, there's a couple of things I'd like to address with regard to it. In the, in the traditional sense, I guess, as to the way the compact reads and the things that go with it, uh, the 12 commissioners, six from New Jersey and six from New York, who were nominated by the governor or serve without remuneration, um, serve as a kind of an oversight body with regard to the authority itself. I think that from the perspective of commissioners, we become commissioners to represent the entire authority, the, the entire port and all of its many facilities over the, the region that's considered part of the port district. And obviously there's several things it's supposed to do. Obviously it's supposed to promote economic development, um, maintain um, all of the facilities that are part of it. But with regard to that, there's always been, I think, a dichotomy, too, based on the fact that for New Jersey commissioners and New York commissioners, there's always been somewhat of a built-in tension with regard to making sure that each state gets its fair share of the dollars that the port generates. And although that's not written in any of its bylaws or anything along those lines. It's certainly a factor, and it's something that I've always been asked about. You know, you, you know, I want to make sure that New Jersey gets its fair share. And I understand that, um, even though we're supposed to represent the entire port district. Um, and so that's always been a somewhat of a tug here, you know, trying to um, represent the entire port district and, and do everything that's possible, but at the same time look out to make sure that the economic issues for New Jersey are also taken care of. Well, I guess along those lines, who do you consider yourself responsible to? Uh, the people of the state of New Jersey, the users of the port facilities, uh, the institution of the Port Authority? What, to whom is your fiduciary <clears throat> responsibility first addressed? I think that the, uh, the fiduciary responsibility is to the um, uh, is to, I think, all of the users of the port facilities, I think. Uh, the citizens of, and, and the citizens of the two states, I think. And in that... And stewards of those facilities. Stewards of the facilities. Do you also have a role as a commissioner in oversight of the process of the Port Authority? By the process, what do you mean? Well, things get done at the Port Authority. Right. It, it, there's, uh, there's inputs and there's outputs. Um, 
roadways uh, get improved, bridges get built, buildings get built. So there are things that get done um, that are implemented by hundreds if not thousands of employees of the Port Authority. What is your level of oversight as a commissioner of those things that get done? I think the, the, the role there is the approval of the projects, <clears throat> which is done at the monthly meetings um, that, are, that um, are funded by the uh, rate, by the uh, toll payers as well as other <coughs> avenues of revenue for the authority. Such as, for example, in New Jersey would be the, um, the Bayonne Bridge um, or the Gothels Bridge, um, Terminal B at Newark Airport, um, things along those lines. Okay. Uh, earlier in answering the question I had asked about what you considered your role as a commissioner to be, one of the items you mentioned, I think I understand it correctly, was to bring back uh, projects, bring back money to the state of New Jersey. Well, no, I, I said that that's one of the, the, the kind of the, t <coughs> believe me, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> um, I'm cognizant of that issue, clearly, uh, as a resident of New Jersey. Um, you know, our responsibility is to the whole port district. Um, I'm sensitive to the projects that, that are part of New Jersey as outlined in New Jersey's public policy, yes. To what degree do commissioners provide any level of oversight um, into the accountability of things the Port Authority does. Uh, what type of oversight do you have if the rules and regulations of the Port Authority are being followed? Well, as far as I, my understanding with regard to that is that to a great extent that's handled by the permanent staff, which is the executive director. And how would you know if that permanent staff was adequately performing its function to ensure that the rules and regulations were being properly followed? Well, with regard to the fact if um, there was a, a, um, an IG's report or anything along those lines with regard to a violation of that. I guess what I'm getting to is uh, why we're here today and how this process started. As a commissioner of the Port Authority, I'm not sure you're aware of the entire history. This process actually started in the Assembly Transportation Committee. Are you aware of that? I believe so, yes. Okay. Uh, and the Assembly Transportation Committee uh, obtained subpoena authority in the last legislative session. Are you aware of that? I believe so, yes. Okay. One of the things you may not be aware of, and I want to represent this to you, but I want to ask you about it as well, is the Transportation Committee had done several FOIA requests to the Port Authority. You're familiar with FOIA requests? I am. And are you aware of the fact that those FOIA requests were just not answered? I was not. And one of the arguments for the Transportation Committee obtaining subpoena power back then was the fact that the FOIA requests had not been answered. Were you aware of that? Uh, I was not. I don't recollect like that at all. My question to you, based on that history is, as a commissioner, how do you know or what steps are you able to take to make sure that when people are asking for information from your agency that they're being responded to? Assemblyman, I think that from my perspective, um, <laughs> Quite frankly, uh, I, I have no problem with full transparency of the authority and, and the things that it does. Quite, I, uh, I think that's a, a very important issue. Um, I think I was, I, I heard people complain with regard to the FOIA uh, application process of the authority itself. We had changed it over the course of time to try to streamline it to be able to allow information to be flow out as fast as, uh, faster than we, that, than we, than as might have been in the past. Um, but traditionally, those types of things have not come to the port commissioners to take a look at at all, unless someone raises that at a public session. As a commissioner, if you had a question about a FOIA request, had I uh, thought to contact you, for instance, when the right. Transportation Committee did not get answers to the FOIA request that it had made, if I had come to you with that, who would you go to to find out why these FOIA requests were not being answered? 
I think I would have gone to the uh, port council, uh, Mr. Bookbinder, who I think oversees that process. Okay. Now, do you get at, and I had the privilege of being at a uh, port authority meeting with Senator Weinberg, and the assembled staff is sitting in front of the dais of the commissioners. Correct. When I was there, I didn't hear a lot of reporting from that assembled staff. Is there a point in time, either in committee meetings or in other venues, where uh, people like Mr. Bookbinder or other staff members report to commissioners such as yourself about what's going on? Well, the answer to that is yes. Um, the, the, port, the way the port is structured is that the, uh, the port meets once a month, um, except for August, so it's 11 times a year. Um, on that particular day, similar to the legislature, or the way I, I remember the legislature used to be, there'd be committees in the morning and then there'd be an executive session and then there would be the public session with regard to that. Um, particularly with finance, um, we have started to uh, hold some of the committee meetings on a separate day or more frequently, so maybe there's two meetings a month with regard to that. Um, at those meetings, um, often the different agency heads, depending on the project that might be involved, uh, would be testifying or giving a report with regard to that. Um, and uh, that's, what ha that's, what, that's how we would see the information. I guess what I'm trying to get to is, uh, as a legislator, um, it is likely I could find your phone number or contact you and have a communication with you, and maybe I should have, and said, Pat, we're not getting answers to these FOIA requests. Can you look into it? Uh, not everybody who submits a FOIA request to the Port Authority is a legislator. True. What I'm frustrated by and, and, and would like to have a response from you on is if an ordinary citizen sends in a FOIA request and they don't get an answer, and their follow-up letter is to the same people who didn't answer them in the first place, what are they to do? <laughs> That's a very good question, actually, and I, I think it's a very apt question. I think it was one of the frustrating things we saw, I saw originally when I was there. Um, and I guess that's the, the issue with regard to an agency that has a, a, a long history in, in existence. I, I think that was one of the reasons we took steps to, to streamline that process to make it easier for people to make that application and, and send the information and get the information that they request. The, pr the issue I don't know, and I don't have that statistic in front of me at all, is how many of those types of requests that they get on, an a, on a regular basis. I just don't know the answer to that. But I guess my question. I, my, my, here's my point, I guess. What, my what final should... point on this is simply this. I would prefer, from my perspective, more information is better than less information, and FOIA requests should be answered. I appreciate that. And so, uh, I'll give you my cell phone. <laughs> to, to, the, to the extent, you know, obviously, there's a whole checklist of things that people look for in terms of making sure they're not giving out uh, attorney-client privilege and things of that. But generally speaking, your position is, is that FOIA requests received should be answered or at least some type of correspondence back saying, here's why we're not answering them. Correct. Okay. I believe that. In this particular case, that did not happen, which precipitated the subpoenas. Some of that preceded your tenure, which started, I believe, in 2011. July 1st. Some of those uh, FOIA requests were uh, before July 1st, 2011, some were after. But the subpoenas that the Transportation Committee uh, issued uh, came clearly after you were on the Port Authority. As a commissioner, uh, were you made aware of the receipt of the subpoenas from the Assembly Transportation Committee? I, be I believe so, yes, I believe so. Did you ask any questions as to what the committee was looking for? Um, I did not, no. Why not? I, to be honest with you, I don't remember. Okay. Uh, material was provided to the Transportation Committee by the firm of Gibson, Dunn and Crutcher at that time. Uh, but not all of the material that was requested of the Port Authority. Were you aware of that? Uh, no, I was not. Um, you had said earlier that you believe transparency is a good policy. Yes, I do. Um, 
when you were made aware of these subpoenas from the Port Authority, was there any discussion among commissioners at any commission meeting or subcommittee meeting about the response to the subpoenas or the uh, deliberation as to what to give and what not to give? <laughs> any, any discussion with regard to giving and not giving, I do not remember any discussion with regard to that. I, I, I remember that the, uh, I think the, the chairman had recommended that we obtain counsel with regard to that, but that's it. That's all I remember. I really had just come on, and I, I, I was not familiar with all the issues that were raised here. So I, I do not remember any of the other aspects of that, quite frankly. So as a commissioner, you were made aware of the subpoena. What I'm trying to find out is so that who, from an oversight level, you would agree that you, commissioners at least have some oversight level of what happens at the Port Authority? Yes, I do. If not you, what commissioners would have oversight of that process? Well, normally it would be the chair, the chair of the authority or the vice chair of the authority uh, in conjunction with the deputy executive director and the executive director. Because okay. those subpoenas were not fully answered and that committee expired at the end of the last legislative session. Are you aware of that? I'm, a f I'm familiar with how the procedure works with regard to legislative sessions, but I was not aware of that. And that this committee renewed those subpoenas uh, under the Joint Legislative Investigative Committee. I, I don't know that. Okay. Um, still unanswered today, and I'd like your position as a commissioner, still unanswered today are the unanswered portions of that subpoena that was issued by the Transportation Committee. And in particular, the subpoena asked about the toll increases. Right and had asked for communications between the Port Authority and either state's <coughs> governor's office. And those have not been provided. Were you aware of that? Uh, no, I was not. As a commissioner, would you be in favor of providing those communications? <laughs> I, I would like to, I'd, I'd like to take a chance to get a chance to review the subpoena and talk to our council first with regard to that. Uh, I, um, I know how I felt about the toll increase. Um, I know it also is a heavily partisan charged issue. Um, but I'm, I, wanna, I would prefer to talk to our council before I, I, I answer that in any way, since we have it, since we have council on this. But as a commissioner, uh, the question to you is, if there's a subpoena to the Port Authority for, among other things, documents related to the toll increase, including communications before, between the Port Authority and the Governor's Office. What is your position? Should that material be turned over? Uh, co cover your, cover, yeah, cover the black The, I, I, I since the, <laughs> Since the authority has counsel on this, I would prefer to be able to talk to them uh, with regard to that issue before I answer it. I'm asking, you're, you're appointed as a representative of the state of New Jersey. This committee has been looking for information, uh, and its predecessor committee had been looking for information. And on at least one portion of those requests, going all the way back to the FOIA requests, which were not, never answered, we have still not gotten an answer. Do you believe the authority should respond to the subpoena? The, the answer to that question is simply this, that um, uh, subpoenas should be responded to, but I, I, when we have counsel for this particular purpose, I'm not going to, to make any statement uh, until having had the opportunity to review with counsel that issue. Were you aware that your counsel has represented that this matter has been submitted to the board for consideration? I was not aware of that, no. Okay. I would suggest you follow up with them because that's what we're being told is that it's in your court. Uh, I w yes, certainly I will uh, take a look at that. In answering that question, you stated that you had opinions about the toll increase, but in stating that you didn't express what your opinion was. Certainly, I'd be glad What to. is your opinion about the toll increase? I think they were, they were merited. Um, 
I, let me if, let me just start by saying this. Um, I traditionally am a fiscal conservative with regard to dollars and cents. The authority itself receives its funding primarily from a series of streams of revenue. The tolls are a significant amount of that revenue, uh, also added to our fees from the airports, parking, and rentals, which represent primarily the full amount of how the, the authority receives its revenue to do its projects. This year in 2014, its budget will be, I think it's going to be $8.2 billion, which consists of a $2.7 billion, $2.9 billion um, operating budget and a $4.4 or $4.5 billion uh, economic um, capital plan. When I first came on, I um, was appointed, as you said, Assemblyman, um, I, I took office on July the 1st. And, um, I think the first thing in the door, as I came in to go to the first meet, when I, let me back up. When I f was appointed, the first thing I did over the summer was to tour all of the facilities. I toured all the facilities from one end of the state to the other that were part of the region. Who gave you that tour? Uh, the various people in the various locations. Um, just to get a, a feel for the, the people at all levels, the line, the managers, the agent, uh, and, and people like that, as well as the the facilities themselves. But one of the first things I was told at the beginning was that there was a toll increase pending, which was not the best news I wanted to hear coming on board at that particular time. However, I understood the responsibility, and um, I made an appointment to see the CFO, Mr. Fabiano at that time, with regard to the financial picture of the authority. And um, he spent a considerable amount of time uh, with me over that uh, issue. And um, I came away with the understanding, as much as I didn't like it, that the toll increase was necessary for the authority to continue to do the things that it does, which is to develop the economic development issues that are port important to the Port District, that are important to both New York and New Jersey. But more important to that, my concern as I went around from the different facilities was the state of good repair of facilities, um, whether they be um, the issue of, 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 of the airports themselves uh, or the tunnels or the bridges uh, or the port, the, the actual port facilities themselves, many of them are, are, are quite old. They're decades old um, and they're in need of refurbishment. Uh, one of the things I think that gets me really angry, I guess, as a Port Authority Commissioner, if I read a column where somebody says they hate to go through JFK Air Airport because it's one of the worst airports in the nation um, or the globe, that bothers me. It, it shouldn't be. We should be a, a, a showplace with regard to that. The bottom line on that simply is that the only way those things can be maintained, upgraded, and put in the important and keep those facilities <coughs> proper and safe is for the appropriate amount of money to be raised. That doesn't require, unfortunately, making hard decisions with regard to toll increase. I didn't take it lightly. I believed in it. I believed in it firmly with regard to it, and that's how I felt about it. Now, you're aware that the original toll increase uh, called, the proposed toll increase, called for a 75% increase in tolls for Easy Pass customers, and I believe it was a 112% increase for cash customers? I, 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 quite frankly, don't remember what the percentage was, um, but I'll, I'll assume, I'll take your word for it with regard to that. Would you agree it was eye-popping? Um, I didn't hear what you said. Would you agree that it was an eye-popping amount? Look, any toll increase in this, state of, in this state of the economy and any tax increase or any type of increase is eye-popping to, uh, to most everybody. When you first heard those numbers, uh, was a presentation made to you about where the money was coming from and where it was going to? As a commissioner, did somebody come to you and say, Commissioner Schubert, we want you to understand the need for X dollars coming in here's where we're going to get it from and here's where it's going to. Well, the money, I mean, in this case, because the focus was on the toll increase, the money was coming in from the toll increase. I understand that. And, and, My question is, is did somebody then, sit down there, with you and provide you with a presentation or a spreadsheet, graphs, charts? I believe, the answer to that is I believe so, yes. Who would have done that? Mr. Fabiano. Mr. Fabiano. Who was the CFO at that time, since retired. And Mr. Fabiano made a case to you for that initial amount, the proposed amount of the toll increase? Yes, yes he did. And. Did you agree with him that that was necessary? I wanted to, I, not at that time. 
I, you know, I wanted to take a look at it. I, I it started to build up a, 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 um, a sensitivity or a feel for the authorities' um, uh, facilities, having look, eyeballed them myself rather than look at them in pictures. And I could clearly see the need in so many different areas here. Um, and um, that experience was kind of like the foundation for me of how I felt about the increase um, in the necessity of doing some, you know, some of the, the hard decisions that come with regard to that, uh, that type of an issue. Um, so I felt that, yes, that it was necessary and that to a great extent, a, a lot of that was going into these types of projects or these facilities which I had seen. So would you agree that at some point in time he convinced you of the necessity for that toll increase? Yes, he did. Okay. At some subsequent later date, that amount was reduced? Yes. What did he do to convince you to now vote to approve a lesser amount? I'm not sure. I, I, don't quite, I don't remember whether he convinced us. I don't think there was much choice in the matter um, with regard to it. That was the, the decision that had been made, and uh, you know, that's, how we had, that's what we had to accept. As a commissioner, you were told you had to accept the decision? No, no, not, not so much that. I don't mean that. Um, the, I, I, actually, I, I don't remember exactly the, the chronology of what happened. I know how I felt with regard to the increase, um, and I believe that these were not going to fly necessarily with the governors of the two states. At any particular meeting of the Port Authority, did you express your concern for the users of the Port Authority Trans Hudson facilities for the toll increase? <laughs> Some, yes, I, 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 I am very cognizant of that. Um, I, you know, although I don't use the bridge a lot, I, I have used it, quite frankly, and I would be paying that myself. Um, the fact of the matter is that um, I had to take into account that and try to temper that with what I saw were the needs of keeping these facilities as safe as we could keep them too, so nobody got hurt, injured, or killed. The facilities you're talking about, does that include the World Trade Center? In my, it, it, look, I, I, does, it, does it include the World Trade Center? Um, the World Trade Center is one of our facilities, clearly, um, and it's, it's an issue, the issue of maintaining that, its security, um, and, um, and providing for it to provide the economic uh, uh, give back to the authority and to the region itself was important to me too, yes. At any time when you were being asked to consider this very large toll increase, did you ever say or express a concern about that money being used to build buildings as opposed to the state of good repair, which I agree with you on? Uh, I, I don't remember, to be honest with you. I just don't remember. Recently, there was a discussion at the Port Authority in the commissioner's meeting about granting a $1.25 billion subsidy uh, right. support to build yet another tower, or to finish yet another tower at the World Trade Center Center. Are you familiar with that? I am familiar with it. Were you in favor of that? No, I'm not. I'm opposed to it. Why? Because I think we've done enough there with regard to whatever the port can do in the facilities that are there, and they, the, the private sector needs to do the rest, and the private uh, investment community needs to do the rest. The port needs to move back to um, its, core its core mission with regard to regional development and transportation. That's how I feel about it. Is, I, I, so I, you would agree that real estate development is not a business the Port Authority should be in? Well, I, I'm not going to say that, because I understand that we do have real estate that w is part of the port's portfolio. Um, so I'm not going to say categorically we shouldn't do that at all. What I'm saying is enough is enough for Mr. Silverstein. That's how I feel about it. Um, and um, the, uh, we need to move on to do other things that are important to the port, like the, the bus station at 42nd Street. These are things that I think are important for us to do. Uh, the continuation of the, the bus terminal up at, uh, at 175th Street. Um, are very important. They're important to uh, New Jersey, too. Um, and I think enough is enough. Um, I, I, am, I am cognizant of the sensitivity 
that this region and maybe the globe has for that area as ground zero and i'm sensitive to all of the nature of the things that have to be balanced to provide for its redevelopment which took a tremendous number of actors to make happen i'm also cognizant of the fact that we are at the point now where i think we've done what we need to do and no more um and um i think it's now part for mr silverstein and his private developers and and other investors to play the role that, that with regard to that and the port does not need to do that is your opinion with regard to the 1.25 billion dollar subsidy your opinion that you just expressed with yeah. regard to the 1.25 billion dollar subsidy is that shared by the other commissioners from new jersey i can't i Something that I'm very reluctant to, to, to talk about other, what other uh, commissioners might feel about this. I would say this, um, the, there is a, a strong feeling among New Jersey commissioners against it, and you may be familiar with the fact that one of the New York commissioners, Commissioner Lipper, uh, who was a former, de a former deputy mayor under uh, former Mayor Koch, has uh, been very much opposed to it. So. Um, at that's, this is the point that we're at with regard to it. But when we left the meeting um, um, several weeks ago, the vice chair had indicated that the uh, private developer, Mr. Silverstein, was looking to provide for some new information that might bring the private sector into this deal. I have not seen anything on this at this point. But as the deal stands now, I can't support it. Former Chairman Sampson in his private capacity had previously represented Mr. Silverstein. Did you ever raise that as a concern to Chairman Sampson in any of your deliberations on the Port Authority? Uh, no, I did not. Were you aware of that? I, I wasn't aware of it at first. I think I became aware of it later on as time moved on when he recused himself on various matters. Did you view that as a very awkward circumstance? I. I I don't, I did not, um, and I have a great deal of respect for Mr. Sampson and Mr. Sampson's leadership, quite frankly. Um, and uh, the, the uh, and uh, several of the commissioners have had different issues for which they need to recuse themselves with over the course of time, and I don't, I, you know, it is a process that we have. We've updated it, quite frankly, um, to make it even stronger if possible or more transparent, that's the word. Um, so, no, I, I did not. You never expressed an opinion to him that he should recuse himself? First of all, I, I, he did recuse himself, as far as I knew, um, and I did not express any opinion to him. Okay. And I just have a couple last questions. Uh, when we started your testimony, at least the part that I was asking questions of, I had asked about your role as a commissioner of the Port Authority, and among many different things that you talked about, you viewed yourself as a, a, a fiduciary, if you will, for the users of the Port Authority. Is that correct? Yes. Uh, the toll increase, in order to happen, has to have public hearings. You would agree with that, correct? Yes, I do. Uh, and the purpose of those public hearings is so that the, those affected by the toll increase could have an opportunity to be heard. Correct. Do you agree with that? Yes, I do. There were eight public hearings for right. the toll increase. You're familiar with that? I am. They were all held on the same day. Are you familiar with that? I don't remember what days they were held on. I just don't remember. As a commissioner of the Port Authority, is the hearing schedule for the public input of a toll increase that you're expected to support brought to you for your consideration? The the. We did, I don't believe we voted on a, 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 the public hearing schedule. I don't believe so. don't remember that. Since you were being asked, at least initially, to support a 112% cash toll increase and a 75% easy pass toll increase, did you at any point in time say, we have to spread these hearing dates out? I did not, no. Why not? Well, I, first of all, I was new to the authority. Um, I didn't know how they operated with regard to this at all, quite frankly, and it happened relatively quickly before anything, any, I could say anything with regard to it. I think it, it, I would say this, in retrospect, looking back on that, and the authority has changed its policy with regard to this for the future anyway, if there is a future with regard to these types of things. Um, 
I think that the hearings need to be held on a, on a staggered basis with commissioners present for those meetings, um, whatever the requirement might be with regard to that. And I'm more than happy to sit for those if that's the case. Um, I'm hoping we don't have to do that again. Um, I was not comfortable with that. No, I was not. Um, I, I think that the, uh, the, the public has a right to be heard on those issues. They do impact their pocketbook. Um, we've made some changes with regard to that going forth. Um, that doesn't address the issues then. Um, the issue of, of, of more public hearings, scattered public hearings, um, and uh, the commissioners being present, I think, is all important with regard to that. Your former county executive. Yes. Correct? Um, as an elected official in your past life, uh, you know that public input is important, correct? Of course. Um, and you know that it's important for those who are responsible for the impacts to be present and to see the public impact, correct? Certainly. Uh, so even though you were new to the authority at the time, why did you not go to any of these public hearings? <clears throat> I, don't, I don't remember. I just don't remember. I have no really? idea. I don't. 112 or ultimately 100% toll increase, and you don't remember? I remember the toll increase, quite frankly. But uh, the fact of the matter is, I, my, under, my understanding of the procedure was this is how it was set up. Okay. And I accepted that. Fair point. That. Fair point. And I, I just don't. But, but, it, but the fair point is this, that I don't necessarily, looking back on it, <laughs> there's... You know, sitting from the perspective of having been a public official myself, um, uh, you know, looking back on things, I guess hindsight is twenty twenty, but uh, looking back on certain things, uh, including this issue, as well as the way we conduct our public meetings, um, clearly calls for changes in, in the way we do things. And we've started to implement those changes over the course of time. If, if there's anything that's come out of this, uh, hopefully that's one of the things that will, be stay, that will stay permanent with regard to it. But at the point in time this was happening, you didn't raise your hand at one point in time and say, eight hearings in one day, that's wrong? I did not. And you didn't at any point in time say, hey, commissioners, are any of us going to these hearings? I, I, I did not, no. And given all your experience being a public official, that didn't strike you as odd? I, I didn't think of it one way or another, to be honest with you. I just didn't think any, uh, anything of it one way or the other. Madam Chair, I have no further questions at this time. Thank you. Assemblywoman Handler. <clears throat> thank you very much, Madam Chair. Mr. Foy, thank you for... Mr. Uh, Schubert. Mr. Foy, <laughs> sorry. Mr. <Schubert>. <laughs> Forgive me, Mr. 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 Schubert. Um, I have uh, two broad areas <clears throat> of inquiry uh, and I, questions that I'd like to pursue. Um, and uh, please understand that um, I, I, I hope you won't take any of this personally, um, but clearly you're the first representative of the Port Authority to come before us and we do have matters to explore to help us um, understand uh, the dysfunctionality of, of your agency. Uh, might as well call, call a spade a spade. Um, I'd like to begin by talking a little bit about the Port Authority's procurement process. Okay. Presumably you have some procedure <clears throat> that is supposed to be followed to ensure that major purchases are free of political and personal influence and the taxpayers get the most for their money. Um, the, the, yeah, there is such a Procedure. The answer is yes. yes. I'm sorry, I didn't know okay. if you were waiting. No, no, no. Yes, the answer is yes. I just realized I should ask the question. Okay. Um, since you've said that there is, uh, within that context, <clears throat> I'd like to know how you explain a $500,000 payment to an architect who was never hired and whose work you had no need for. Um, I'm not familiar with what you're talking about. Okay. You're not familiar with what I'm talking about. Um, According to news reports in late April of this year, um, one of your colleagues, Commissioner David Steiner, hand-delivered plans for the Gothels Bridge that had been drawn up by a famous architect who was a friend of his. Um, as I understand it, these plans were hand-delivered to the commissioners. So since you were, in fact, on the commission at that point, you must have seen them. 
Um, and you, again, because you were a commissioner, and I'm assuming that you're informed the way all the commissioners are, you knew that the Gothels project had already started, and that in any case, staffers had already seen this design that had been hand delivered to you by your colleague. But you decide to pay him a half million dollars anyway. Why? Assemblywoman Hanlon, um, I, I have to tell you I'm not familiar with this issue. Um, I, uh, the, I, I know Mr. Steiner, obviously. Um, Mr. Steiner is now, I guess, our senior commissioner on the authority and, is, and, and has a tremendous amount of background and, uh, and uh, expertise in real estate, among other things. Um, but I am not familiar with this issue, quite frankly, and uh, I'd rather not answer that only because I don't want to speculate on it. I'm more than happy to look at it, however, um, and, um, and, t and, and take a look at that um, uh, uh, for future reference. I, I, I don't understand. Are you telling me then that you were not in the room when the decision amongst the commissioners was made to pay $500,000? I don't, this design? I, quite frankly, I don't remember us, I don't personally remember voting on that myself. I don't remember. Well, in fact, according to news reports, um, the, there was no public vote. And uh, some people, some observers have suggested that the reason for choosing the $500,000 figure was specifically to meet your own requirement. Um, to spend no more than $500,000 without a public vote. Um, and a apparently in some back room somewhere at the Port Authority, someone agreed to pay this bill. And you're telling me that as a commissioner, you didn't know the first thing about it. Is that I, I, correct? Sorry. I, I can't answer your question because I just don't know the facts with regard to it. I really don't. I don't know whether that's true or not. Okay. Um, well, let me just go on and, and uh, again, I, I don't really understand how that could have happened, but I'll, I'll certainly take your word for it. Um, if, uh, whether you were part of the decision-making process or not, it has been publicly reported, reported and certainly not refuted that this $500,000 was paid to this architect whose design was never solicited. Um, and from what I'm hearing, you, know, you as a commissioner knew nothing about it. Um, no, one ever, you know, no one ever said after that information appeared publicly that it was wrong. So I think we can assume that it was right. Now, if it was right, um, it suggests to me that the Port Authority routinely ignores its own procurement processes. Um, do you know of instances where that's happened? No, I do not. And to my, in my experience, the um, procurement policy of the, of the authority has been pretty, um, pretty stringent with regard to it um, in the reports that are given on the uh, projects that come before our committees or the, or the body itself. I have not known that to be the case. Um, and again, I, I don't want to speculate on this one because I'm just not familiar with it. Um, Okay, well, I guess the, I have a, a quote from a letter that was written by your attorney, Mr. Bookbinder, to Mr. Sampson. Um, okay, well, you, this was before your time. This was in 2011, so I guess you didn't know about it. Um, but comments were made that the reason for the Port Authority paying the $500,000 <coughs> was to avoid a lawsuit um, after this famous architect delivered his design and I suppose someone thought perhaps he could sue the Port Authority for not appreciating his artistry. I, I don't really know. Um, you, so you're, you know nothing? No, I do not. About, I'm not familiar you know, with this Nothing about the question of whether the Port Authority routinely pays people off outside of its own procurement processes to avoid lawsuits. Uh, let me say this. Um, we don't do that as a matter of course. Um, do we get sued? Uh, join the list. Uh, but the fact of the matter is we do not do that. Good. Okay. We don't do that. Good. Uh, well, I'm, I'm, glad, I'm glad to hear that vehement denial. 
Um, okay, let me move on to my other broad area of inquiry. I'm sure you are aware, I um, hope you are aware, that a suit has been filed against the Port Authority by Jersey City. I am. Okay. Um, understanding that you can't talk about um, the issues in the case, um, I still would like to um, bring up um, some information that was included in one of the exhibits um, that are, that is, a, uh, one of the exhibits that's attached to the actual complaint. And I have that exhibit, which we can pass around to all the members of the committee if you'd like to. Um, I would expect that as a commissioner, you would be familiar with the information that is in this exhibit, which is very simply a list of properties that the Port Authority owns in Jersey City. Okay, so as a commissioner, again, I assume that you would know the properties that this agency that you, you administer owns. Okay, now according I'm, I'm to- I'm aware that we have property in Jersey City. I don't think I have an encyclopedic knowledge of each address though. Okay, no, you don't need to, no, that's not important here. Um, I wanna point out, and you may or may not remember this, that the Port Authority, according to the exhibit that I've passed out, owns 40 properties in Jersey City. Um, dozens of those properties have been held for 30 years and never, ever used for public purposes. Um, many are vacant. Some, ha some have been used for private purposes. Um, all of them have been taken off the tax rolls. Now, as a commissioner, can you tell us how exactly does this promote economic development for New Jersey? <clears throat> well, first of all, I, I um, haven't seen the exhibit, number one. And I, I, quite frankly, I haven't seen the, the complaint that was filed other than um, a notification that a, a suit had been filed by Jersey City uh, against the authority. That I'm familiar with. I, did not, I have not seen the complaint, and I haven't seen any of the exhibits, although I gather I'm going to get one right now. Yeah, okay. Well, I note also that you're not the only one uh, who hasn't seen this list of properties because the list of properties is unavailable to the public. Um, I have to assume that many other property acquisitions are hidden from the public. Um, why? W wouldn't you agree that the public should know how its money is being spent on buying land? <clears throat> Since this matter is in litigation, I'd rather not comment on it because it is a, it's a significant amount of money that's involved in this piece of litigation. Um, I, can, I would say this, that the authority is looking at its inventory with real estate with regard to seeing what we might want to keep in the future and what we might not want in the future with regard to uh, the authority's um, financial picture. But I, I, whether it relates to any of these, I have no idea. And I'd rather not, sp I, I, I would like to be helpful to you, Assembly and Hanlon, but I don't want to, um, I don't want to comment on something I really haven't seen. But would you what exactly is the Port Authority's policy on land acquisition? Well, I mean, if it's like anything, I mean, if land, act, if, we, if the Port Authority, and I don't know when any of these, <laughs> let me back it up. I have no idea when any of these properties were acquired, quite frankly, um, and I'm sure they all were acquired before I came aboard. Um, the, there may have been, uh, um, given back, given the history of the port, which goes back to 1921, um, there may have been reasons to hold on to these properties. I don't really want to speculate about that. Um, and maybe those reasons aren't valid anymore. I don't know. But, you know, again, without the issue of, of having seen the complaint or even, even talking to, we haven't even had a report from council on this. I think this was filed after our last meeting. Um, I'd really, I'm uncomfortable to uh, comment with regard to it. Okay, well, without being specific with regard to the, this complaint uh, or the exhibit, which again, I would think it contains information that any commissioner would be familiar with. But again, setting that aside, would you agree that the Port Authority should have a policy stating its reasons for spending millions and millions and millions of dollars on real estate? Well, uh, something, women, I, I'm not sure if the number is accurate, quite frankly. And I, again, I'm, I'm very reluctant to 
uh, make an across-the-board statement with regard to the authority's le uh, real estate policy. Suffice it to say that as a result of the uh, review of the authority uh, over the last couple of years, we have looked at moving forward with trying to sell properties that we don't need any longer, I would agree with that, um, to provide for extra revenue for the authority. I have no idea whether any of these are part of that, quite frankly, and I don't even recognize them. Um, well, I'm, I'm glad to hear that you're reviewing properties to see whether you need them anymore, because um, to tell you the truth, I mean, at, at this point, it appears to the public as though the Port Authority amasses properties like a billionaire collects art, you know, not because you need them, but just because you can. And in the absence of a formal written policy along the lines, for example, of uh, indicating that policies are, are um, identified because of the, their, uh, their need in order to augment trans-Hudson transportation facilities. In other words, uh, properties are chosen because they are relevant to furthering the, the mission of the Port Authority. In the absence of a policy like that, um, it, 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 it is very difficult for me to explain to the citizens of New Jersey, and I would think for you as well, um, whether there are any controls at all on their tax dollars as they flow into the Port Authority and their revenue dollars as they flow into the Port Authority, or whether these decisions are made at the whim of one or another staffer who is in turn at acting on the whim of one or another political patron. It's very disturbing. I'm sure you can appreciate that. I, I can appreciate it, Assemblywoman, and I, and I appreciate your concern with regard to it. It would be a concern of mine, too. I would say this, that we do not acquire property willy-nilly, quite frankly. Um, uh, we, any property that the authority has acquired um, has pr more than likely has been for some form of project uh, that it had in mind with regard to it. Now, Jersey City, of course, is a very vibrant city. Um, and we have a number of facilities there. And of course, it, its dockage or the area along its docks has been very important to the port um, in its history. So I, whether these properties were acquired over long ter term periods for that purpose, I just don't know. I, I'd like to help you on this, uh, but I can't because I just don't know enough about it. But I would say this, that it is our, you know, it's, at least it's my feeling that obviously we, should, we shouldn't be acquiring properties uh, just for the purpose of acquiring them, unless they have a valid public purpose uh, that fits within the port's um, mission statement of economic development and, and transportation issues. Then we're agreed. We are. Okay. Thank you, Commissioner. You're welcome. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Assemblywoman, uh, Assemblywoman Hutto. Thank you, Madam Co-Chair. Uh, welcome again, Pat. Uh, we certainly appreciate you joining us this morning and discussing the Port Authority with us. Just want to mention again, you certainly have a long distinguished career in public service, a mayor, assemblyman, and of course county executive when I served as a freeholder uh, with you and now as Commissioner of the Port Authority. But I think for the purpose of this meeting, it's important to us that you were the chair of the Governance and Ethics Committee at the agency um, and that you served <laughs> on a special committee of the Board of Commissioners of the Port Authority that reviewed the agency after the 2011 total hikes, correct? Uh, yes. All right, so, so through these roles, I would hope that you have an in-depth knowledge of the government, of the governance structure of the Port Authority and a critical understanding of the problems that plague it. Um, we know that the Port Authority has been unfortunately um, called wasteful abuse and gross mismanagement. It's become the hallmark of the Port Authority. So I'd like to just change the conversation if I could, and get your opinion on the culture sure. of the Port Authority. Um, on January 31st, 2012, uh, as a member of the Special Committee of the Board of Commissioners of the Port Authority, you sent a letter to the governors of New York and New Jersey presenting the first phase, as we all know, the audit report conducted by Navigant, an independent right. auditor. And I think it's very well known that the report called the agency challenged and dysfunctional. And dysfunctional. We yes. all know that. I, don't, I mean, I have a copy of the letter, but I don't know if it's necessary. You, 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 you authored it. Um, and the report also stated that the Port Authority needs a top to bottom 
overhaul of its management structure. So can we talk about the culture and the structure, the management, stru management structure, how we got to that culture? You know, we, I'm also going to say, you know, there could be competition, which we heard today, the rivalry between New York and New Jersey. So could we start, I guess, um, if you agree with that assessment, and can you explain and maybe elaborate it for us and clarify it? Valerie, I'm sorry, Assemblywoman, are you, are you talking about the, uh, the, the Navigant reports? Phase or, one, and, and the yes. Phase, phase one on the letter that you sent on January yeah. 31st, 2012. And then, there, of course, we'll go to phase two uh, to see what recommendation, if, if they ever took place. But phase one originally called the Port Authority challenged and dysfunctional. Yeah, I think that any agency that um, has been in existence for as long as it has and is, in this particular case, a uh, bi-state. Is, is the, That's a letter, yeah. I guess. Uh, I've got it. Thank you. Uh, is, uh, is a bi-state agency requiring anything to be done with it, uh, which has always been the conundrum of getting both states to agree, has always been very difficult. Does it sometimes, uh, as a result of that, get complacent in the things that it does? Probably it does. Um, there is a long history of um, decades service to the authority by its employees, which is, I think, um, I, I think it, it, it is important because it does provide for a continued experience with regard to it. But maybe as a result of that, we don't always get relatively new blood uh, in that. And as a result of that, it can get complacent in what it does. And I think that was our concern, that it was basically complacent in, 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 in how it operated, that it, um, if things, if we always did things like this, um, then why change them? You know, you understand that concept? If, if things are always done this way, why change them? My feeling simply was that as I looked at it and over the course of time, having come from other entities and observed, I thought there were other ways we could do the things we do. For example, how we conduct our meetings, for example, which we've now changed uh, and things along those lines, at least from our perspective in that. The other thing I think we wanted to do, particularly with finance, was to make the Finance Committee much more robust uh, because of the uh, issues with, that had been raised uh, by the toll increase and the, and the fiscal issues of the authority itself. And I think we've done that now with regard to its more frequent meetings, taking the temperature of the authority fiscally, et cetera, et cetera, and things along those lines. It took quite a while um, to get, I guess, the independent audit, the Navigant report. Right. Um, did either governor request before that, uh, when was the last independent audit ever done? Uh, I don't know the answer to your question. I know that this Navigant report um, structural review of the authority was ordered to us by the governors of both states. I just want to continue on that, if I may. Um, you find, it also underscores the objectives of finding ways of lowering operating costs and increasing operational efficiencies. Um, what were the operational inefficiencies that the committee was targeting? And has, have you made any progress in reducing those inefficiencies? Well, I think that the, uh, the issues that uh, we were looking at, well, first of all, I would say this. The authority's budget, as it relates to operations, has pretty well been static as far as that goes over the last several years. We, the employees, the amount of employees we have has pretty well been static, too, over the course of the time that I've been there. Um, I, I think the issue for us was what I would call siloing of agencies. In essence, the authority itself is made up of a series of different entities that are responsible for a particular service. So we have airports, ports, tunnels and bridges, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And the question I think that was raised by Navigant too was whether the information from each of those authority uh, agencies was being shared within the greater authority. One would think that that would happen, but in agencies as big as that, it doesn't always happen. Um, communication breaks down, there are inefficiencies along those lines, and we wanted to prevent that from happening. Um, for example, uh, one example of that um, was, the, uh, was security issues. Uh, which are extremely important to the authority, which has been attacked twice now. Um, the issue was that a security often 
uh, was each entity was dealing with security in its own way with the budget rather than a, a comprehensive policy. We have changed that. We now have a full, we have a security, um, a, a security officer responsible for all of the security at all of our facilities with regard to those types of things. So those were the types of inefficiencies that we were talking about in the report. You mentioned the siloed bureaucracy. bureaucracy. Um, those weaknesses were listed as a lack of consistent leadership, uh, a siloed bureaucracy, uh, poorly coordinated capital processes, insufficient cost controls, lack of transparent and effective oversight of the World Trade Center. Um, any of these, I mean, you mentioned security, but that wasn't mentioned as a, a, a prime weakness in the report. Any of these various weaknesses addressed? Yes. The, 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 the overhaul of the, uh, fiscal, the finance committee of the authority, which is meeting now on, a, I, I want to almost say, a monthly basis to, to, to and a new CFO, um, has helped us to keep a, a, get a, a greater handle on the authority, uh, its investments, um, its capital projects, um, and um, its fiscal policies, which I think have made a great change in the information that's available to us with regard to that issue. So that has been addressed. It, we continue to monitor it because it's extremely important to us, too. Another point on that report, it asked its executive management team to look at implementing a merit-driven compensation program. Um, if not merit, uh, what was it or what, how, are you, how are the employees compensated based now? Is it merit? Have there been any changes made to implement this program? Well, I mean, I think we've been looking at the merit system. We have, uh, to a great extent, as you may know, um, a number of, uh, of represented, uh, represented uh, employees, in other words, collective bargaining, um, and um, some of those contracts are due at the present time. We're, we're, we're they're negotiating them now. In fact, um, I'm not familiar with the fact of whether where the what the uh, uh, extent of the merit um, uh, the merit pay issue is with the authority at now. And if I could get to the structure now, because I think this also sort of lends itself to the culture. Um, there were major changes in the composition of the board of commissioners and the senior management of the port, including the chair, David Sams Sampson, vice chair, Scott Reckler, uh, executive director Pat Foy, and deputy executive director Bill Baroni. Uh, all of these appointments obviously were political appointed by both, go both governors. Um, after 90 years of the Port Authority, the new leadership dramatically changed its corporate governance and placed the Board of Commissioners, including yourself, in many aspects of the Port Authority's operations. Um, I would say that with the political appointments involved in the daily operations of the Port Authority, uh, did that create conflicts with full-time employees holding senior and staff uh, positions who actually is supposed to run, I guess, the operations, right? Be, yes. The history of the port, they're supposed yes. to be running the operations. Yes. So if the new leadership dramatically changed its governance and placed the board of commissioners, including yourself, in many aspects of uh, operations, uh, how did that work? Uh, did, that, did that contribute to the culture? Or did that, can you <clears throat> elaborate on that? Or, or just kind of clarify that for me? Well, I, I have my own opinion going forth with regard to, and I may have mentioned it at the meeting that you attended uh, back a month ago, or two, two months ago, right. I guess, may have been, when we had the experts come in to review the, uh, the structure of the port. Um, uh, here's how I look at it. Uh, very simple. And this is the issue with regard to, to where the input comes in for the policy to be established. It appears to me that if the commissioners are appointed for that purpose, that should be their role. If that's their role, then commissioners appointed for what purpose? Uh, for the purpose of oversight of the of the authority. Okay. Then I personally believe that if the governors of both states and the Senate or the legislatures have given their approval of those individuals, and then they should be given the full authority to 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 do what they need to do with regard to the authority's operation. Now, this may not make me popular in Trenton or Albany, but I do believe that um, the, that means that the following, that I think the authority should be responsible for uh, vetting and doing a first-class search for, uh, for the director, 
um, and that the director um, should be responsible then for um, vetting and doing a search subject to the approval of the authority for the deputy director. Um, I think the commissioners themselves, given the, the need for the balance between the two states, should develop who the chairman and the vice chairman are. I have no problem with, obviously, clearly one being from one state and one from the other. Um, and that's how I feel about it. And um, I fully support that concept. I'm, I'm not sure the governor does, or uh, the governor might in, in, in Albany. But uh, having looked at uh, the things I've seen, that's how I feel it should go forth. Yeah, that and was, I think I said that, yeah, too, that on that Yeah, that was one day. of the recommendations, the board choosing the executive director in a nationwide search right. um, versus mm -hmm. the governors. And, and certainly your thoughts, um, I guess, need to be discussed. Um, the, the governor also made a recommendation, I think it was back in March, since we're talking about changing some of the structures or the governance, um, <coughs> dismantling the Port Authority, actually, from uh, under one roof to two. What are your thoughts on that? Well, um, go, having gone through what I've been going through over the last several months, I, I actually almost thought that that was a good idea. But the, the point of the matter is I, I do not think it's a good idea. Um, first of all, I have a, I'm concerned that New Jersey would be a loser in that, uh, it, depending on how it was divided. Um, are there changes, the significant changes that need to be made? Yes. Um, does the authority need to be blown up, so to speak, and, and, and removed? I don't think so. I think that's draconian. Um, and I think it's throwing the baby out with the bathwater. I, 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 I have to say that my experience at the authority in the short time that I've been there has been that the overwhelming number of its employees at all of its levels are extremely professional. And some of the hardest working people I've ever had the, uh, the pleasure or, or the uh, privilege of working with on some really, really cutting edge issues. Um, and I don't think they should be uh, adversely affected accordingly. However, um, I do think that uh, going forth, the authority needs to be, to, be, um, to be reformed. I think that's important, but I would not want to see it, um, um, so to speak, uh, terminated. And I, and I think that if I, if I could, I think there's a unique opportunity right now um, because of what's happened, but also going forth from the fact that, um, from what I've seen at least, um, and by the representation that was at our that one meeting that, that yourself and Senator Gordon were at, um, there was uh, also uh, representation from the New York Senate and the New York Assembly. Rarely have I, if ever, have I seen um, collaboration that way on an issue that deals with the port. It's always been one of the conundrums of dealing with the port. Uh, so I, I think that to the extent that that could be capitalized on, yeah. I think it's a great opportunity. Yeah, we were there together. We have been working on reform uh, by state with the uh, assembly members from New York and senators from New York as well. But it, it brings back the point of the competition between the representatives of both states. You know, is there a, rival a rivalry? You know. Are there conflicts, again, between the appointed employees and those hired? Uh, you know, this all lends itself, again, to that culture of abuse and, and you know, mismanagement, possibly. But, you know, so, so what do we, you know, the competition and the rivalry, uh, what do you feel about that, and how do we resolve that? Well, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not personally familiar with the fact of that being an, uh, that that being the case. Clearly, in any body, uh, in any public body in which the, um, you have a mixture of, of permanent employees um, who are professionals, and then with the change uh, in Albany or Trenton, uh, there being other employees added, I, I assume there'll be some tension with regard to that. Um, I, I, I don't necessarily, I, I personally haven't necessarily seen that with regard to the authority itself. It's commissioners right now, um, um, other than maybe the Silverstein issue, have been working relatively together in, in harmony with regard to trying to provide the things that the port does. And I just wanted just a couple of more questions on this culture and the management. Uh, since 1997 to present, there have been seven different executive directors, directors right. of the Port Authority. Um, 
And you would agree that the executive director is somewhat like the CEO in private business, correct? I would agree with that. Yes, I would agree with that. So we have the executive director, the deputy director, and then, of course, the chair and vice chair. Uh, that should what? What do you believe the board's role is to set the policy? Who, who's actually doing the day-to-day -day operations? The executive director and the deputy executive director do the day-to-day -day operations. I mean, it's, it's like any public body in which you're appointed to, um, and you're a part-time official. Right. Um, so, so which brings me to the question of, I guess, the emails back to the, you know, the bridge lane closures. I guess that's why we're here as well. Um, I think the chairman received some of the emails, but the executive director did not, right? Uh, I think I'm, Director Foy, not, he was I, the one that, I guess, found out too late. He didn't really know or understand what was going on with the day-to-day -day management of the of the, um, what do we call it, the bridge realignment here? What do we, uh, the bridge closures? Uh, but, but seriously speaking. Assemblywoman, we call it what it was, lane closures. Thank you. Um, but seriously speaking, um, so, so the director who you say is in charge of day-to-day -day operations did right. not know about it, but the chairman seemed to have some emails and deputy and, Wild scene. So we're going back to that whole structure of how the culture has really, I guess, frayed the mission of the Port Authority, quite frankly. And, that's, and, and, and I think that that's the reason that I made the strong f statement I did on that day at the committee meeting, and uh, I think I shared the comment with you afterwards, um, how I feel about going forward in a reform effort uh, with regard to the structure of the authority how I feel about that. Because what happens now, I think, and, it, and there's a balance to be struck here, quite frankly, and this is the issue that I wrestle with. On the one hand, the authority needs to, it, it, it can't be so independent that it is not subject to public oversight or public um, accountability, all right? So we can't go that far over this way to insulate it from that. On the other hand, you can't make it, um, so amenable to the political winds that it changes on a, on a, its personnel at the top change on a, on, a, on a regular basis, as you mentioned with regard to the changes in the executive director. I would mention, however, tragically, that one of those losses was because the executive director died on 9-11. Having said that, and being very cognizant of the fact that employees died that day, um, the, um, in a 93, the, the fact of the matter is what, what the structure does today, in my opinion, is do this. It creates at the top permanent level, now not the, the, so much the commissioners who come in and out on a, on a monthly basis, but on the, per, on the top level, it creates two lines of authority that go in two different directions. In essence, one goes to Albany and one goes to Trenton. Now, I understand the need for the input to come in from the two states to establish the public policy. I do, I do, I do, I understand that very much. But on the other hand, it, 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 it can lead to a dichotomy in, the, in, the, in what happens in, in one side of the authority to the other. And, and I think that needs to be <coughs> taken care of. It needs to be changed. I believe that the reform that is needed to make that happen is what I've advocated, even though I'm not sure it's embraced uh, completely, um, but I, I strongly believe that that's what needs to be done here. I agree, but again, you know, the port was one of the best-run governmental entities um, and respected as a well-run company uh, for many years. Certainly, I, you know, I, I want to stress the fact again, and, and do you think there's any coincidence in the breakdown of the culture of the Port Authority reaching that tipping point at the same time the board uh, put itself more in charge of daily operations. I think, uh, you know, from what I gather, and, and you would know firsthand, if that was the tipping point, and if that needs to be, and, and that's what we're talking about, that needs to be reformed. Um, I don't know the answer to that. Well, I mean, it just is very coincidental. And again, as we talk about the operations by the employees every day, and then the chair and the, the board itself becoming more involved of daily operations, there seemed to become more of that culture that has, again, frayed the mission. 
And, and if I just want to Oh, conclude, I, I understand. I understand. Yeah. yeah, okay. I want to conclude on the mission, and, I, and, we, and you certainly spoke about it with Assemblyman Wisniewski and Assemblywoman Hanlon about the real estate. But, you know, the current mission, and it's, it's very simple. It's, um, what does it say? It says, the mission is simple. Uh, keep the regions, commuters, and uh, travelers, and global shippers moving. That's certainly right. a very su succinct mission. Um, I know that Senator Schumer has said recently <coughs> that the mission certainly not where it was, the core mission. We've, we've moved, you've moved, you have moved away from it. Uh, it's become a cookie jar, uh, a rainy day fund. And so when we talk about the core mission, what is the core mission still of the Port Authority? And, think, and oh, when we can get to the real sorry. estate, and then I'll just conclude because I think you've repeated it, but I'd like to just know again. The core mission uh, of the authority as it, as it was founded um, is really for to promote the economic, de uh, economic development within the Port District, and I would uh, define the Port District as um, a 25-mile circle around the lower New York Harbor, but I'd like to say around the Statue of Liberty. Um, and that includes, in that, um, port facilities, uh, bridges, tunnels, uh, airport facilities, which became part of its jurisdiction over the course of the evolution of transportation in um, the United States. Um, some of the things that you've mentioned are ancillary to that or promote portions of it, depending. We need real estate, for example, to develop certain things with right. regard to what we do. I just want to interrupt one second, if I may, Pat. Real estate is fine, but you know we're talking about um, billions in cost overruns and the deals of the port considers you know the largest New York City developers. Um, so I just should it be in the business of real estate development? Just a yes or a no? I'm you know I know. Well, I, I, I'm not prepared to say it shouldn't be because sometimes real estate development can be an important um, feeder of of economic development in an area, provided it comes within our our jurisdiction. What might be more pertinent would be to the extent that both states require us to undertake other things that maybe are outside the port district um, for other reasons, that might be an issue. Um, I think that uh, real estate is an essential, valuable asset that can um, accentuate some of the things it does depending on where it's located. Over the course of time, have we potentially obtained properties for which we no longer have use? That's possible. And we are reviewing those uh, for the purpose of selling them. Obviously, we don't want to keep them if we don't need them. Um, and um, that's, that's an ongoing policy for the authority itself. And I just want to end. And uh, let me go back to one yeah. other thing, if I might. Um, and that's the, I mean, the, the, big, um, the big issue here, I think, is probably the World Trade Center. Um, and look, if I had been here in the 1970s, maybe I would have made a different decision with regard to what should have happened in lower Manhattan at that particular time, but there were, I was not, and the governors of the states were different. Um, and even going forth in the aftermath of um, the terrible tragedy of 9-11 and what should happen to the site itself, um, I was not here at that particular time, and maybe there are other decisions that, that may or should have been made with regard to that, but it's neither here nor there now. Um, the site itself, uh, both its the One World Trade Center, the museum, and the um, memorial grounds have um, a resonance to us emotionally that is um, very important. Of course, um, and I just want to end because at the end of the letter, I think you stated we must now move to a new era for the Port Authority. Uh, I hope that we will move to a new era for the Port Authority, but I think I and the rest of the board, uh, certainly or the committee here is disappointed um, with the little, I guess, oversight uh, the board actually has done, you know, after the lane closures and it's in its aftermath. So with that being said, thank you for uh, answering the questions. Thank you, Madam Co-Chair. You're welcome. Uh, thank you. Senator Gill. Thank you. I have uh, a couple questions. Um, and good morning. Sarah, good morning. Thank good morning. You for, um, good afternoon. Good afternoon. I've been correct. I'm sorry. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> thank you for appearing here. 
And my questions um, really go back to uh, some very basic things, because I know even if you change uh, a structure, but you don't change the mindset of those people who control the structure, then you have uh, done very little. And in um, the history of the, of, of the port, and I think it's important, in the history of the Port Authority, it has been a very well-run organization. Uh, and to the credit of its, uh, not only commissioners, but the people who work there. So that in my questions, I think we have to bear in mind not to uh, paint such a, take such broad strokes with the brush that we diminish uh, the um, good works of the port itself and of the people who work there each and every day. And so that in that regard, I think the port became a culture that we are now faced with when it put the commissioners in charge in a more substantive way of the operations of the port. I do not feel, and we will get to some questions, that the structure of the port itself created the culture, but it was the change in the governance of the port that put commissioners uh, in charge in a more substantive way of daily operations that uh, created a political culture that we now face. And so um, as we go forward here, you were the chairman of the Ethics Committee for the Port, correct? Correct. And when were you, uh, when was your tenure of, for chair of the Ethics Committee? Um, I think I was, uh, it might have been appointed at the, uh, sometime in 2012. I don't recollect the exact date. All right. And uh, as chair of the Ethics Committee, what was your function? Well, we overlooked uh, the issue with regard to the ethics training of our employees. Um, took a look at the best practices in both states, and we looked at the issues with regard to the statutory requirements for disclosures um, and things along those lines that each state ha has, as well as the uh, public posting of those uh, to the extent that we have possible with regard to that. Did mm -hmm. your jurisdiction for ethics cover the conduct of uh, the commissioners themselves? conduct of the commissioners? Mm -hmm. um, I, I, it's never come up. I, I, I really don't know. I'm asking you this. As chairman of the Ethics Committee, did your committee have jurisdiction over the um, ethical conduct of the commissioners? I don't, the, there, each state has an ethical, an ethics commission for which I, my understanding is these, are the, are indiv these individuals would be responsible for. Um, the issue itself with regard to the commissioners, I am unaware of it ever having come up. I, I don't know the answer to your question. You don't know if you have jurisdiction? I, I haven't had jurisdiction in the past. Do you, do you know if, uh, the jurisdiction of the committee uh, goes to its commissioners? We, the, to this extent, we uh, make sure that all the commissioners um, in each state follow the laws of each of their state with regard to disclosure, reporting, ethics training, et cetera. Okay. Now, when did you receive or hear about uh, Pat September 19th email with respect to uh, the lane closures. 
I don't remember the date I saw it. Uh, it, was, it was days afterwards, I think. And did you actually read the email, or did you simply hear about the email? I think I heard about it. Did you ever read the email? I think I've since read it, yes. Uh, when you heard about the email, did it indicate that it was a possibility that uh, the actions violated state and federal law? Um, I, I wasn't able to make a determination with regard to that. I didn't ask if you were able to make a determination. I asked you if you were aware that Pat Foy stated in his email the conduct may have violated state or federal law. I, I just don't remember that, that piece. I, I just don't. I, you don't remember uh, reading it, or you don't remember? I just don't remember that, that part of it. I'm sorry. You don't remember that part of it. Right. Now, I. Uh, when you did read the email, did you discuss it with anyone? I don't remember discussing it with anyone. You had, uh, and you were part of the ethics committee. True. Okay. And if you had remembered that someone, and I'm, because we're talking about this great change in uh, the structure of the Port Authority going forward. And I'm just asking questions about the practical working of uh, hearing that uh, something that happened in the port may have violated state or federal law. Now, do you remember when you heard it, when you read Pat Foy's email? Uh, I'll withdraw that and rephrase it. Did you ever read in the newspaper that Pat Foy uh, stated? the conduct may have violated state or federal law. The conduct of the lane closures. Uh, oh, thank you. Um, I, I, I'm sure I read it somewhere in the paper, but I don't remember where. Now, you had a series of meetings at the Port Authority on uh, September 13th. September 16th, September 17th, and a full meeting of the Port Authority, I think, was on September 18th. And I would refer you to your calendar. That's where I got this information from. Um, some were uh, ethics committee meetings. Some were the joint, um, what do you call it, the JWG, joint working? Oh, the joint insurance working group. A joint insurance working group, right. correct? Uh, and then some were for the finance meeting. Okay. At any point, did anyone at any time in any of those meetings, including the board meeting in the pre-board meeting, ever bring up Pat Foy's email? Um, I don't remember it being brought up, no. Did you, if you remember, ever discussing anything with anyone at those meetings? I, I did not. Email? Okay. Now, uh, you received from, I think, Senator Weinberg the letter that has been marked as, I think it is tab one. If we could have that up. What letter, what date is that? Sorry. That would be uh, September 19th. Yep. Okay. And that's a letter you discussed with Senator Weinberg. It is. And I'm going to have a few questions from my perspective. After you received the letter uh, from Senator Lime Weinberg, uh, you communicated, did you communicate with anyone else? Well, with Senator Weinberg. With and anyone? With, and with Mayor Sokolich in Fort Lee. Okay. At, did you at any time communicate with David Wildstein? Mr. Wildstein had called me to tell me that the governor's office had called him, that the letter had been there, uh, that it, the letter had re been received by them. I had not seen it. Did you ask Mr. Wildstein for the letter? I, I don't remember whether I did or not. I just assumed it was going to be coming to me anyway because it was addressed to me. 
Um, what did you say, uh, what did Mr. Wildstein say about the governor's uh, office receiving the letter? Uh, that the letter had come in, uh, and I think he gave me the gist of it. I, th I thought, I don't remember that, but th that was probably it. Okay. And what did you think of the letter? Um, well, I, I, what did I think about the letter? Um, I was somewhat annoyed, and I said that before, because it, it, I thought it was personal to me. Um, and uh, that's how I felt with regard to it at that particular time. What did you think? Now, we know you have this personal issue, but we also know that I would assume just uh, what you expect from the people who work at the Port Authority, you expect another level of, I think it was called um, in the re one of the reports, an extreme professionalism, correct? She, she was, that even though you may have a personal issue with Senator Weinberg, the issues raised were with respect to a public policy uh, issue, correct? Something that involved the public. This was not a personal thing from uh, Senator Weinberg that you didn't call me back. She's saying that there is an issue of public safety with respect to this lane closure in her letter. The letter said a number of different things. I, 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 want, I, I've indicated what I, I, I believed about the letter in my response to Senator Weinberg. I Weinberg's understand you didn't like, you had some personal things going on or what you thought was personal with respect to Senator Weinberg. I'm asking you as a professional, because we all sometimes receive information from somebody we don't like, or we may even think that they're sending to us because they don't like us, but you have to make, but since you are representing the public and you have a fiduciary responsibility with respect to the public, you weigh it. So I'm talking about the issues, the issues raised in her letter. Did they give you concern? Not if she was personally involved in trying to make you look bad. None of that lunchroom stuff. I was, I'm talking about if she raised in the letters that there was a public safety issue with respect to the lane closures, that um, it has caused significant hardship in the area. It has caused congestion in the area. And there was a safety issue for the public. Did you evaluate those concerns and those issues raised? I, I, I did not, no. Okay. Now, when you uh, called David, when um, you said that uh, David Wildstein called you, did you rate? Did he rate? Did he raise with you any concerns expressed by the governor or the governor's office with respect to the issues raised by Senator Weinberg's letter? No. What did he say to you? Just said that this letter had been had arrived, and um, gave me the gist with regard to it. That was what he said. And did he give you any of his personal opinions per ab about uh, this situation? His personal opinion? No. Okay. I'd like to turn to tab four. Now, uh, let's, take a fir the, let's take a look at the first two emails uh, in this chain. Uh, tab four, do you, do you, I want to make sure you have. I see it. You see it? Okay. Now, in this tab, uh, this is what, what do you know this to be, uh, this document? I, I don't know what it is. I mean, I can read it here. I, I, I see what it is, but I never. Did you ever receive this document? No, I did not. 
Do you want to take a look again? You provided it to us, so this isn't a document that. Uh, I didn't. No, I didn't provide this one. I withdraw that. Mr. Wildstein provided it to us. Had you ever seen it before? You're, you're talk, which one are you talking about now? Uh, Number four? Mm -hmm. No, I had not. This is the first time you've ever seen first it? First time I've seen it. Okay. Uh, and um, if you will read the top. So I want to make sure that this document Where you say, hi, David, hold the letter. Oh, I'm sorry. Now you're talking about number five. Number five. Yeah. Okay, I'm sorry. It's I'm sorry. Where it says, hi, David. Yes. When you say, hi, David, hold the letter till you hear from me, what letter were you referring to? Uh, I had asked him at the time. Uh, at first, the first thing I, I suggested is I asked him if he would draft a response for Senator, Wein, uh, for Senator Weinberg. And, um, and I'd just like to stop you. Was that the procedure that uh, David Wildstein would uh, draw, would respond to letters of concern uh, sent by state legislatures? I have no idea. I had no experience with it before. So then why'd you ask him to read um, well, to a Well, I, I don't have a secretary. <laughs> And I asked him if he could draft a letter from the from for me as the commissioner to Senator Weinberg with regard to as it as it, as it was stated there. That's how I I asked him. So you didn't go to uh, Pat Foy or no. uh, anyone else to say uh, what should the response be to the issues raised in this letter? Well, no, I did not. Okay, so you asked David to uh, do a response. Do you know if the letter, dear Senator Weinberg in here, right? thank you for the letter, et cetera, that's up on the screen, is that the letter you were referring to that David should hold? Yes. Okay, so you read uh, what David um, developed as a draft, correct? Yes. All right, that's what we were referring to originally. Okay. Okay, so now I want, who is uh, Jared? I think his name is Phil, Phil Coe? Uh, I believe works in the uh, press office at the authority, I believe. I believe. I, I'm not sure. So you don't even, you don't, you're I, not I sure? Don't, I don't re remember, quite frankly. Okay. Uh, so you don't know exactly who was uh, drawing up this response? Uh, no. Okay. Uh, I think we'd, we'd note that uh, be prior to working at the uh, Port Authority, um, since you look at things through, um, you know, a filter, personal filter, he worked as a special assistant to the chairman of the New Jersey Republican uh, Party and uh, in the governor's office and then on uh, Governor Christie's campaign in 2009. So when um, he wrote this, you told David, hold off, correct? Yeah. Um, first of all, I have no I, I have no rec I have no knowledge of what you just said. Um, having said that, um, the um, I, in the meantime, I then had called Senator Weinberg with regard to that, and I did not see the necessity to send the letter. Okay. And then um, at tab six. Yes. You did receive an email at 9.45 a.m. from David Sampson. I'll, I'll give you an opportunity to. Um, let me see what tab. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm looking at, I'm sorry. I, I, I understand what now I, the, I was referring to different numbers you were referring to because I was looking in different areas. Okay, so we, we're all on the right tab now? Yes. Or should I say the right page? Yes. <laughs> now I have it. Okay. Uh, if we go to tab six. Yes. And Senator Weinberg, in her letter of concern, because you said it was personal, but in her letter of concern in raising what I am saying are serious issues of public safety, um, she also 
CC that letter to um, the governor and to David Wildstein, correct? No, no, David no. Sampson. David Sampson. I assume David Sampson. Yes, because I, 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 I combine them. Right. So I don't know who's going to be more insulted. Uh, so uh, you, she cc'd it to Governor Christie, and she also cc'd it to uh, Ms. Mr. Sampson, who was the chair of yes. the board. Yes. Uh, and then um, he sent you an email. Yes, he did. And why don't you read this the email for me? That is with we start at the bottom with respect to uh, what Mr. Uh, Samson email says. You sent me an email that said, Pat, I received a copy of Loretta's 919 letter to you about her being disappointed on a personal level. What a jerk. Do you want me to do anything, D? And what did you uh, take that to mean? Do you want me to do anything? I didn't take it to mean anything um, because I had spoken to Senator, uh, Senator Weinberg already and I kind of responded that way in my email. And then what did, uh, and when you responded about 10 minutes later, can you please read to us your response sure. to Mr. Sampson? Hi, David. That's kind of you, but no, it's okay. I decided to surprise her with a direct call and tell her I was disappointed she had made it personal. I don't think she expected that. I think she has never gotten over our 1998 race. Best wishes, Pat. And then Mr. Sampson responds to you. Uh, as good well. for you. If anything further ensues on this or anything else, I hope you know I am available to contribute whatever you may feel could have value. Okay. Now, after hearing you read the emails, what really in the response, in the responses here, I think one part of the e email David Sampson calls the so senator a jerk. And I apologize for that. No, but, I'm not asking you to apologize. But I am. Well, you know, maybe he should apologize, and maybe you should apologize sooner, but what I'm, this is what I'm getting to here. When a senator writes a letter that raises real public policy and public safety issues, and after reading your emails, what really comes to mind is the old adage, to attack the messenger in order to avoid dealing with the message which, as you know, uh, and that's why uh, it's troubling, because this seems to be apparent throughout this whole proce process. We saw it in the Mastro's report, portraying Bridget Kelly as an unstable, hysterical, and even at some point, someone said, as a woman scorned. Because if the lane closures were done, by an unstable woman and David Wildstein, then the public would not need to continue to look for more answers. But we know that once the interview memos were released and this committee became, began to conduct hearings, we learned there was more to the story. When Michael Juniak testified before this committee, and he testified that he read Pat Floyd's September 13 email. And even though Pat Floyd wrote that federal and state laws could have been broken, he viewed the issues raised by Pat Floyd through a colored lens because he knew that Pat Floyd hated Wildstein. And we see that Mr. Sampson does the same thing. When he learns of Ted Mann's Wall Street Journal article on September 17th about the lane closures, what does the former attorney general do? He emails the vice chair about how he has been told that Foy leaked the story, which is bad for New York and New Jersey relations, and that Foy is playing in traffic and making a big mistake. Never in these exchanges is there a focus on the serious issues raised. And I must say here, you as a former Bergen County exec, a former assemblyman and a commissioner at the Port Authority, 
you will receive a letter from the majority leader who also represents the affected area of the lane closures. And yet, it's dismissed. The Senator's legitimate concerns, and I'm talking as reflected in your email, the legitimate concerns about the lane closures because you believe that she's still upset from an election that took place over 15 years ago. Is, is there a question? Or that a question will be when I a fellow commissioner and chairman of the Port Authority, it's not that we need to find out what happened. It's not that uh, we need to, and as you as the Ethics Committee, see exactly what the senator is talking about. It's this throughout the process, and you are an example, but there are others, as I have denoted, that the immediate response is to attack the messenger to avoid dealing with the message. And that is a... Um, concern of mine that I think has been uh, evidence throughout the testimony of everyone who has testified from the governor's office to you at the Port Authority, so that as we go forward, this is, and I say this, having served and worked with uh, the Senate committee, then in the assembly, uh, on um, racial profiling. And we were able, <coughs> the Black, Hawk, Black and Legislative Caucus, the Senate committee, uh, bipartisan, the attorney was Michael Chertoff, there were federal state investigations, but there was a respect of the issues presented not a political interpretation and attack on the messenger. So that I have actually participated in a Senate and Assembly and legislative hearings where at the end of the day on something like racial profiling that also had constitutional dimensions and that could have but did not to the credit of all involved, dissolve into a name calling and personal attack. And I say that was the height of government at its best dealing with a public issue of constitutional amendment, uh, constitutional dimension. Because had we conducted ourselves in the manner that uh, it has been exhibited here in terms of attacking people, not the message, but the messenger, we would have devolved into an ugly, unforgivable, unproductive, and shameful uh, display with the racial profiling and we didn't. And we came out with laws recommended by the Senate Committee, the, caucus, the um, Assembly Caucus, uh, everyone that have been um, lauded by the nation. And as a state, we came out the better for it. So as a, and I'm telling you why, and I will make this a question without asking for an answer. It is, as we say, rhetorical. That when this happens, the danger that the people in control of the apparatus cannot separate their personal animus from the public policies and issues raised inures to the detriment of the people of the state of New Jersey. Thank you. Thank you. Excuse Excuse Senator O'Toole. Through the chair. Um, Pat, do you need a, a, a break of any sort before we? 
No, I'm okay. I think it's the chair is the... Unless the, I'm sorry, unless somebody, unless you want one. Well, I'm I okay. Is the, is the plan to go to one o'clock? Yeah, so the plan is after this going to executive session, just so we're all clear. Okay, great. So I'm ready to ask questions uh, through you, Chair. Um, can, we get, can I have one, one second, second please? Sure. <laughs> if I might. Um, Senator Gill, thank you. Um, I, I wanted to commend you for your work on the other issue, as you mentioned, but I would have to say Excuse to you. Excuse me. Are you answering a question now? Yeah, I th well, I thought I was, but. Is there a question? I have no question. Well, so I'll do, uh, do respect. You can cover anything Senator O'Toole's got. But I, I, I don't necessarily agree with the characterization, and that was m my concern um, that, uh, you know, um, the, uh, I, I commend Senator Gill, and I, I well understand her expertise, too. And um, I, I just don't uh, agree with the characterization of, of going after the messenger. I mean, quite frankly, um, you know, maybe there, there's there more could be done, but the fact of the matter, I think I'm the only one who actually reached out to anybody uh, on this issue at all, quite frankly. Um, and um, I think I'm probably the only commissioner who's actually come to this, to the, come come before the group, actually. And anybody who's asked me, I've tried to answer all of their questions with regard to, I've been very cooperative with everybody. Okay. Thank you, through the chair. Um, good afternoon, Pat. Um, we've been here for about two and a half hours. I've listened to your testimony. Uh, I think uh, the first thing you said in your handwritten statement was that you knew nothing about the closures, uh, and I think uh, the chairwoman, the co-chair Weinberg, accepted that as an opener. From everything I've read and heard, I, I would share uh, that conclusion that Senator Weinberg talked about two and a half hours ago. Um, Pat, through the chair, I have a number of issues I just want to touch on, and uh, I'm just a little unclear on some of the points that were made, so I want to clarify some of those points, if you don't mind. And I recognize, Pat, that we're going back and trying to slow down the tape to September, and you may not recall details, you may not recall conversations, you may not recall uh, emails going back and forth, and if you don't, that's fine, answer to such, and we'll move along. And I do want to say, Pat, I've known you for a long time, I, when you were the county executive and now you volunteer as a port, and you were the mayor. Uh, a lot of us who followed you in the assembly have thought of you as a, an excellent public servant. I still hold that opinion today. And the questions I'm coming uh, to you um, are more for points of clarification sure. so I can better understand what you know and to the larger issue of how do we deal with the Port Authority given the fact that you don't know anything about the actual closures. So having said that, and the last caveat, I understand that you're a commissioner. I understand, I think you're, are you a professor as well at FDU, is that still hold true? I'm sorry to hear are you a professor at a local yeah, college I, I as well? I'm a full-time member of faculty. And that you are of counsel at the Dakota's law firm as well, is that still hold true? Yeah, that's true, that's correct. Okay, so anything that I ask you, Pat, through the chair, I don't want to intrude upon um, any legal representation that your firm may have or have in the past I don't want to talk about any privileged conversations or attorney-client privilege you have with your firm and any of their clients. I don't want to talk, I don't want you to reveal or encroach upon any work product as a lawyer at Dakotas, and I don't want to encroach upon any privileged conversations that you may have had with your counsel or corporate counsel at the Port Authority. So if I'm asking you questions that you think are encroaching upon those privileged areas, I'm sure your, your excellent attorney will tell you that, you know, we can't go there and we can move on. Is sure. that fair? Sure. Okay. The issue that you've talked about with some reoccurring theme through a couple of questioners here is the core mission that you have, and there seems to be some, maybe a conflict, you say it's a dichotomy, of you have six New York commissioners and six New Jersey commissioners. Correct. Now, 
Governor Kane back in the 80s talked about what he thought was the county of Essex government, he thought was ungovernable. He made that comment many, many years ago. Right. And I ask you this question in a very open manner, Pat. Is the Port Authority, as it's currently constructed, governable? Is it as it, as it is now? We see the Navigate report, we talk about how it is challenged and how it is dysfunctional. And we see um, examples of that dysfunctionality. So as it's currently constructed, is the Port Authority, uh, is it governable? Oh, is that the question? That's the question. Yeah. Yes, it is. I, I believe it is. I mean, I know that the, the first iteration out of the box had been, given the nature of what had happened and other issues involving the port, um, um, has been to, you know, kind of uh, uh, terminate it, um, you know, take it off life support and, and terminate it and, and create something new or that. And I, I think that's wrong. I think New Jersey would be potentially a loser in that economically. Um, and is it governable? Yes, it is. Is it perfect? No, it's not, clearly. Um, and I think we've been making, every, there, there are so many different levels now of trying to work out a reform of the authority's governance now uh, that I'm hoping in the end that it will provide for even better transparency for us. I can say this, that one of the things that, some of the things that we've done <coughs> to address some of the issues has been issues of strengthening our recusal policy so that it's more transparent, announcing people who have conflicts in advance of that. Um, the, the meetings themselves have allowed for a lot more give and take, which I'm comfortable with, than the old way it was done. Um, and we are trying to hold as many of our executive, uh, uh, our committee meetings in the, in the public eye as, and, and not doing executive sessions of those committees as we can as we move forward. And that's just some of the issues uh, that we've been we've implemented now. In addition to that, the authority has created its own oversight committee, which um, I mentioned, which Assemblywoman um, Huddle and uh, Senator Gordon had attended a couple of months ago, where we had a number of experts come in and tell us about what they thought the port should look like for the for the future, based on what's happened. And I think all of them, I would be fair to say, think it's continued to be it, it continues to be a, an important agency that should remain doing what it does constituted as it does, but that maybe its governance needs to change. Um, I've given some of my thoughts, which I've given a lot of thought to over the course of this last uh, several months, six months or so or more, <coughs> with regard to um, how I think the authority should look in the future, how we can insulate it a little bit more maybe from pot potential political manipulation um, and recognizing it's a public body. And, and I think if some of those things can be added to it, um, I think it continues to be a very important agency and one that's still very governable. Through the chair, um, from what I've read in the, in the newspaper accounts, uh, historically speaking, the New York governor selects the executive director, the New Jersey governor selects the deputy, and the chair, New Jersey, and the vice chair is New York. Has that always been the case? It's not. I gathered, um, I, I thought it was, quite frankly. I've asked for, I had asked for originally when I came on, I, I asked how do these people become who they are. <coughs> and I was trying to find a, um, something in bylaws or something. I could never do it. It's like a tradition. And I'm not comfortable with those things in a, in, a, in a public body, quite frankly. But you're correct. I understand that the, this goes back to maybe the 1970s or the 1980s in this format. That's what I understand. I may be wrong on that historically. But having said that, the way it works is that traditionally, the governor of New Jersey would pick uh, the deputy executive director, but can name the, tr the chair, and the governor of New York gets to name the executive director and the, the vice chair. That's how, that's how that goes. It's more of a kind of a, 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 an unwritten tradition. The, um, and I don't like that, by the way. You don't like, like that? No, I do not. There were some comments about, again, you, you thought there was a dichotomy of one avenue going to Albany, one going to Trenton on, right. on, on some issues. Is it just systemically or organizationally, is the Port Authority on a perpetual collision uh, course with New York and New Jersey always at each other's throats in terms of trying to get more funding for their homegrown projects? I think that the... Um that's not all, I, I, let me say this, it's not always the case. I would say that over the last couple of years at least, at least in the last 
two years at least, I think that the New, the New Jersey and the New York commissioners have worked together very collegially. Um, and I think the two governors have actually worked collegially, uh, considering um, the personalities of the two individuals. Um, and that's helped us to at least do our public projects to move those forward in the things that, that we've been able to do. Uh, and I think that, that cooperation is extremely important. Are there obviously certain things that New York likes and New Jersey likes differently or, diff or, or they each have their own projects that are more important for them? Yeah, they are, and I, I guess is where the balance comes in. I don't necessarily, uh, Senator O'Toole, don't, don't get me wrong. I, you know, I've had my battles with independent authorities over the years myself. Um, I, I, I don't want to create a super independent authority that's not answerable to anybody. I don't want that in any way of, to come out of this. I do want the reform to go through that makes it more accountable and, and, and prevents issues like we're talking about coming, happening again to the extent we can. To the chair, when you, um, I think you joked earlier that at one point you might have thought it was a good idea to just, you know, deconstruct the port authority. You think it's a bad idea now. I do. Has the port, to your knowledge, conducted a study to actually looking at untangling and creating two separate authorities? Do you know if they have done that? No, I, uh, it's a good point, by the way. Uh, no, I do not know that they've done that. I'm not sure, I, I would tend to think we have not. I have not, I'm, I tend to think we have not. And I just throw it out there to you, Pat, is that if it's possible in, in some of your future meetings to find out if that has been done and if everything's on the table, you have New York legislators, New Jersey legislators, people who are engaged talking about significant reform to Port Authority, maybe before you put it off the table, maybe it should be looked at seriously and find if there's any merit to it whatsoever. I understand what you're saying, um, uh, Senator Tula. I, I really don't like to take any option off the table, to be honest with you, when you're looking for a top-to-bottom reform. Um, I, I just felt, my gut said, and in fact, our present, the, present, the presentations that were made that particular day um, before the Oversight Committee uh, in um, April, I guess, um, I asked that, I believe, I asked that question to, each, uh, to, the, to those experts about whether we should drop the whole thing and start all over again. And not one of them supported that. Um, and many of them had a history with the, with the port of, of understanding its structure its, uh, and its operations over many decades. Um, and I, I, I tend to, that's where I tend to come down on this, too, that it would not be the right move to make. Um, I mean, I, again, having said the fact that I, I, you know, maybe no, all options should not be, all the, the, no options should be taken off the table for review. Um, and we can go back and look at that, Kevin. Someone posed a question today, Pat, uh, through the chair, that um, they want to know who is the day-to-day -day manager of right. the port. I think right. your response was it's the executive director. Well, yeah, and the deputy executive director. You have to understand. Can that. you explain that to me? Yeah. <laughs> that's, the, that's the issue. Um, you've got, um, you have a, a, an executive director and a deputy executive director appointed by two different states. Um, and so... They, um, they both have day-to-day, -day you know, they have both day-to-day -day management of the operation. In other words, it's like a dual head, in other words. In terms of when you go to your monthly meetings, do you work with uh, the executive director? Do you work with the, the both. deputy executive director? Both. 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 And is it the same on the New York side as well? Uh, yes. Because when I think there was testimony about those tensions between New Jersey staffers and New York staffers. Forget the commissioners. Is that right. accurate as well? Are there natural uh, whether, tensions? I'm not sure that it is now. I, I know there had been some issues in the past. How far in the past or how recently? If you last, uh, maybe the last year or two. Senator Gill um, talked about the uh, September 13th email from Pat Foy right. that uh, you don't remember if you read it or not, but you, at some I've point, since, yes, you since yes. read it. In his um, fourth point, I'll uh, quote, I believe this hastily and ill-advised decision violates federal law and the laws of both states. That's what uh, Mr. Foy wrote on September 13th. Were you ever told by Foy or anybody else as to which federal law and, the, and which laws of, of New York and New Jersey were violated? I'm sorry? Uh, I don't recollect.
You were asked some questions about a September 25th email correspondence between you and Mr. Sampson uh, and talked about whether you held on to a 15-year grudge or whatnot. Uh, earlier in your testimony, uh, you said back in September, I think, and I, I hope to get this right, that you didn't pay as much attention because you thought it was of a partisan nature back right. in September, right. not May or not June, we're looking now. Back in September, you stated early on that you thought some of the issues were of a partisan nature. Could you expand upon that, please? Well, I mean, the only, I mean, the only, <laughs> the way I looked at it, you know, it's a, it was a gubernatorial election year. There was a high degree of partisanship going on as a result of that. Um, I, I felt this fed into that, and, and I, I, you know, quite frankly, I, I come in a part of my life where I was kind of withdrawing from all of those <laughs> things, and I just didn't feel I wanted to be part of that anymore. I mean, that was one of the reasons you know, it's one of the reasons I left county executive um, and not did and did nothing else after that publicly, as far as that goes, until I got the call from the governor to do this. Uh, you know, I feel differently about politics today than I might have done in the past. Um, I continue to feel very different about it today than I than I did with regard to in the past, and I, um, and that's how I. I mean, that's how personally I felt about it. Was it? Democrat versus Republican, or was it New York versus New Jersey? No, it wasn't New York, New Jersey. It was, no. I'm sorry? It wasn't New York and New Jersey. It was, no. you thought, New, no. New Jersey Republicans versus Democrats back no, in September? No, no, There's a couple of articles uh, back in 2011 in Crane and New York Times that um, has interviews with Pat Foy in particular. And I was hoping to ask Mr. Foy questions today, but he has been put off for, for the, the right reasons today. And some of the folks who commented ab upon Mr. Foy's past experiences, either at the Empire uh, Development <laughs> Commission or the Metropolitan Commission, the <coughs> words they use in both articles, which I found to be shocking, the word they used, I want to get it right, in Crane's October 9th, 2011, uh, the title is Blame Game Over Port Authority Executive Director Position. Third paragraph said, and I want to quote, and I'm going to ask you if you agree or disagree. Some who worked with him on projects described Mr. Foy as, indec as indecisive and unable to maneuver adeptly between various political stakeholders. Deficiencies, the critics said, would be even more glaring if he ran the bi-state, multi-billion dollar port authority. He can't advance the ball, said one insider. We don't know what he was doing. We didn't know what he was doing. Do you agree with that assessment that was made of Mr. Foy uh, regarding his time when he served in the Empire State Development when he was appointed by Governor Spitzer? <laughs> I, I have no idea. I mean, my, that's not do my... You, I'm sorry. Do, maybe it was, it was I, I, I've never, so you, I, I've never read the article. Do you hold that characterization of him as the executive director at the port? Oh, okay. I um, apologize for the inartful no, question. No, not a problem. I've never read the article, nor have I heard the quotes before. Look, I have a great deal of respect for Pat Foy um, as the executive director. I've worked on with him on a, on, on a, a number of other issues, and I'm not prepared to characterize him that way. Okay. And the New York article, just so we're New York Times, it says Cuomo names a deputy to lead the Port Authority. Uh, that's October 19th, 2011. A second page. His critics, however, and this is a quote, have said he was indecisive and hesitant during his 15 minutes, 15 months leading the, the development corporation. Um, how would you describe Mr. Foy as the executive director during your tenure at the port? How would you describe him as, a, as an executive director? Well, I don't have much to, uh, to, to measure it against because when I came aboard, the other executive director was just getting ready to leave, and, and Pat Foy is really the only the executive director I, I know. Um, while I, I know that, the, you know, there had been some disagreements uh, in the upper staff with each other that might have been personality more so, which I steered clear of, the fact of the matter is uh, I, have, I really have no objection to uh, Mr. Foy's professionalism as the executive director. Um, I, um, you know, he runs the operation day to day, and um, I have no complaints with regard to that Through at all. the chair, do you think going forward perhaps standards should be put in place when a deputy executive director or a executive director is selected, whether they have infrastructure background, governmental background, should there be certain standards, as some have said? Yeah, well, I, as I said, uh, uh, Kevin, as I, uh, I'm sorry, Senator O'Toole, as I Kevin's said, <laughs> sorry, 
as I, as I said, I, I, I've taken a very strong stand on how I think going forward we need to be with regard to the choice of the executive director and the deputy executive director. Um, and I think those should be subject to uh, uh, nationwide searches with regard to that. I, I think that, um, yes, certain standards should be set with regard to what we're looking for in that area. You just can't plop a political appointee into these positions. Um, and um, that's if, how I feel about it. So I guess to a certain extent I agree with what you're saying. If both states move forward with the current model in place, whether by tradition or by bylaw, in terms of the selection of chair, vice chair, executive director, and deputy, should perhaps we think about adopting a procedure where the nominees uh, for both jobs go before the respective Senate perhaps or some other process where there's a crossover uh, approval on both sides of the river. I have no problem with that at all, quite frankly. Okay. Um, I don't have any problem with that at all. Um, and how about commissioners as well? Is that a possibility? That perhaps there should be some crossover approval. Oh. <laughs> it was hard enough going through Trenton yeah. than to have to go up to Albany. <laughs> well, but there's no courtesy on the other side. I can, I can guarantee said that. that. Look, from my perspective, I have no problem with anything that would, would cement the authorities' ability to work together. If that would help it, I, have, I personally don't have a problem with that. I don't know if it would be too unwieldy, um, but I, I actually I think there's some benefit. It's not actually a bad idea. I'm just thinking of it. It's the first time I've heard it. Um, there's not there's you know you know I was talking about siloing of agencies within the agency. There could be siloing of the two sections of commissioners from New Jersey to New York at the same time. Although that's not the case at the present time. I have to tell you that. But for the purpose of some form of crossover with regard to the ability of the legislators from the difference of the two different states to understand that the two the commissioners of the other state I, I I think it might not be a bad idea I don't I don't know how it would work I'd have to think about that for a bit but it, it does have some benefit another question through the chair is <coughs> is there a policy in place at the Port Authority that if a worker of the Port Authority or maybe even a commissioner leaves is there a grace period before that individual can take employment with an agency doing business with the Port Authority that's a good question. I don't know the answer to your question off the top of my head. I'm going to say no, uh, but it's subject for my review of the rules again on that. And would you think it's, a, through the chair, a good idea to at least think about individuals who work at the port, yes. say, in any department, I don't I, care what department it is, taking a job with a, a vendor or an agency in which it has been doing business with for the last X amount of years? Should yeah, there be I would, a cooling uh, off period? Yeah, I, I could agree with that. Completely. Um, I think that I think we do that. I'm not sure. If, I think we do that now for folks working in the casino industry. I thought here in New Jersey. I thought we still did that, um, and I thought it was a good rule then. Um, I think it's a good rule now. We have that as legislators. We have a cooling off period. Right. Uh, and and I, I I would have no problem with that at all. Quite frankly, I, I, I may I add something else too that uh, you know uh, you know would probably the other thing too. This might be to add uh, to. Um, Remove commissioners from the requirement, uh, from uh, prevent commissioners from uh, uh, being uh, uh, for political donations too. I think would be important too. Uh, that's a terrific idea. Last question on the same line of uh, having the cooling off period. Um, in 2004, a Bergen Record ran a story about an, a, a top-level attorney in the Corporation Council. I'm not going to use the name because there's no reason to drag his name out there who at some point was appointed under Governor McGreevy as the deputy counsel. And at some point, according to the Bergen Record article, uh, pled guilty to harassment of an individual that he left uh, a series of, I think, obscene phone call messages into a student's cell phone, okay. whether it was an intern or not. There was an investigation. That corporation counsel, according to the article, uh, did not cooperate with the investigation, right. hid, hid the phone, lied about whose phone it was and all that, according to the articles. That individual was promoted and got a $70,000 raise throughout the years. In 2014, we just come to realize that individual, after being promoted again, was, um, he pled guilty. He left, I think he took a severance package. He pled guilty to a second degree charge of forging an individual, a law firm's, a partner at a law firm in New York on a retainer issue, which he pled guilty in New York. My question is, how does the port allow that type of conduct to occur going back from 2002 to 2014? And if you don't know, tell me you don't know, and we'll ask Mr. Foy when he gets here. I don't know the answer to your question. Um, 
It's troubling, obviously, um, but I don't know the answer to your and question. Since you don't know that, I understand you're a volunteer once a month or once or twice a month you go there. Perhaps we should think about putting in protocols that you as a commissioner should be notified when those serious infractions take place and perhaps there's a registrar or there's some notification so the commissioners are on board with the, the um, as you say, the notice issue that so bothered you on the Fort Lee issue, the notice issue about offending, you know, I'm not talking about low-level or mid-level staffers who just have, you know, a parking ticket. We're talking about individuals who have betrayed the public trust Understood. at the Port Authority. Understood. Perhaps there should be some marker as to whether, uh, when you as a commissioner should be notified. I, I, I would agree with that. You would agree with that? I would agree with that. Those are all the questions I have right now. Chair, thank you. Senator, uh, Assemblywoman Karigi. Yes, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, I have a few questions with regards to your committee and uh, information that you get before. Um, well, let me ask you, when a, when a project is presented, when a project is presented um, and large sums of monies are at question, does the commission, do, does your commission, your committee get all the information as to the cost, as to an explanation why it's necessary to do these programs? with these projects? Well, in um, the, first of all, the uh, major projects are vetted through the capital budget first at finance. Mm -hmm. So our, we have the 2014 budget uh, out there now. And then those capital projects are um, then, if approved, they then move on to their respective um, inner agencies for development and eventual presentation before the appropriate um, Port Authority Committee for approval. The dollars, the costs with regard to those operations um, are then outlined uh, over the course of the, of the uh, life of the construction of that project, whatever it might be, um, for us over the course of time um, to, so that we understand that we have the fiscal ability to do what we're going to do there. Yes. So then you're given all that information before you vote in favor or against the project? That's correct. So the, the, your committee, the commissioners, do have a say as to whether or not the project moves forward? Yes, correct? that's correct. Okay. Now, um, with regards to the Pulaski Skyway, that project, were you on the, uh, were you a commissioner at the time that that project? I was not. No, I was not. Um, did you vote on that particular project? No, I was not on the commission, but when that happened, no, I, do, I was not. Um, have you seen the paperwork for the project for the Pulaski I Skyway? I have not, no. Just out of curiosity, what is your understanding to be an access road? Your understanding? Uh, I'd have to take a look at what our rules require. I, I'm not off the top of my head, I'm not familiar with that. Have you seen the articles concerning the Pulaski Skyway project and the fact that, it, that it's an access road to the Holland Tunnel, those articles that have been out lately? I've seen one article. Um, I know that the Port Authority's justification for the project is that it's an access road to the um, Lincoln Tunnel. Are you aware if there was any debate as to how that came about? I, I, I not, I'm not familiar with any debate on that. I was not present at the time, um, so I really can't answer your question. Have, have you taken a position on that project recently since it started? No, I have not. Do you, do you personally think that the, the Pulaski Skyway is an access road to the Lincoln Tunnel? I, I honestly have no idea. I don't know how the authority judges those things. I'd have to look. Are you familiar with the Pulaski Skyway? I'm familiar with the Pulaski Skyway, yes. And you're familiar that if you're on the Pulaski Skyway, you have to get off in Jersey City, go around the Charlotte Circle, take one and nine north? Uh, I, 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 I like to say that I'm very familiar with a lot of New Jersey, uh, um, um, but I'm not exactly from, I'm not a regular um, passenger on the um, on this Pulaski Skyway, and I just don't know how it works on, the, on one end or not. I was just curious because it's over seven and a half miles to the Lincoln Tunnel from the Pulaski Skyway. So I was wondering how that definition of an access road came about when you have to travel through Jersey City into North Bergen, over Union City, and then down into Weehawken. So I was I just curious about that. Um, 
you stated that these projects these uh, come before you and you get information about the projects before you vote on them, correct? We get the financials with regard to them and, and things along those lines, yes. Do you also get the information as to law firms that are representing the, the clients that are coming before the Port Authority? Um, well, law firms don't come before the Port Authority. Or lobbying companies, anyone that represents the interest of these projects? Uh, no. No. Okay. The reason I ask is, for example, in Hoboken, the Rockefeller Group had a study that was done and paid for by the Port Authority. And I was just wondering if your committee, the commissioners, knew who uh, represented the, the Rockefeller Group before they took the vote on it. Uh, no. I don't know. Would you be surprised if I told you that it was Mr. Sampson's law firm that represented the Rockefeller Group at that time? Uh, I, I, I have no way to judge that, that the answer to that question. I mean, um, I, 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 I know that there's been controversy with regard to it. I've seen a couple of articles with regard to it. Uh, Wolf and Sampson is a very prominent firm. Who determines when someone should recuse themselves from voting? The individual or the commissioners altogether? <clears throat> Uh, that's a good question. I think um, the, um, if I could outline the policy for sure. you, is that okay? Absolutely. When we come on, uh, th this is the way it goes. The, the um, potential of a conflict is governed by um, obviously the laws in the respective states and administ administerially is monitored by uh, the council for the Port Authority, who in this case is Mr. Bookbinder and his staff, okay? Now, when, as you know, New Jersey has um, financial filing requirements for its officers, and we file that annually, and they go, they're posted publicly, and we then give a copy to, of that to corporate counsel for his, his or her records, too. Then we give the corporate counsel, I'm going to call them corporate counsel, uh, the corporate counsel, we're going to give corporate counsel a list of any business contacts, we, a business <clears throat> interest we might have. And as the meetings come up and the agenda has been set, the corporate counsel sends an email to each commissioner alerting them to a potential conflict they might have on a particular matter for which a, a recusal would be in order. Can I just stop you there? Sure. That email that sends, that's sent by corporate counsel to the commissioners, is that a general email to all the commissioners? No, it's or not. It's, it's personal to that personal. commissioner. Personal, okay. Right. Then that commissioners uh, would be recused on that particular matter as it came up. All right. Now, the issue of recusal had come up um, over the last year particularly. And... Um, I did a review of that policy and made, and made some recommendations for some changes on that policy um, based on my experience in other bodies as well as my experience um, in, um, particularly in New Jersey. <coughs> and um, I felt that the policy needed to be tightened up. There were a number of reasons for this. And so as a result of some give and take with regard to that, what we were able to do was to even make more, uh, make more available the financial disclosure statements of the two states' commissioners. For example, New York's rule is a little bit different than ours. Sure. And not as good, well, this is New Jersey. This is not as strong as New Jersey's, quite frankly, in my opinion. Can I stop you there? When did you make those recommendations? Um, back in, back in maybe last September, August, September. 2013. Right. And as a result of working that out between the two states, because this required us to give, uh, to, uh, to uh, work with both states to approve this, today what we do beyond that is that at every meeting now, committee and public, each individual item or project is individually voted upon and before the vote is taken, the secretary announces in public who is recused. And that's listed in the public record. That's now, though. That's correct. Okay. And so, as a result of that, that's, and we do that for our committees now, too. Hmm. While that may seem 
um, elementary in a way. It was, uh, it was, um, it, it was a, um, a paradigm shift for the authority because the, you know, we used to vote, for, you know, you'd vote for all the items come together and you know, the recusal would be listed in the, in the minutes. So it wasn't, to me, it was not as public as it should be. I pushed also for the fact of what we do here in New Jersey of requiring a, a commissioner with a potential conflict to step out of the room when that's discussed. Um, wasn't able to get that through. Um, and um, now it's really up to that commissioner in consultation with counsel as to what they might want to do with regard to that. In my opinion, and this is what I do, if I haven't, I haven't had too many, is I prefer to step out. So is it your testimony here that corporate counsel is pretty much the guardian of who yes. should recuse themselves or not? Yes, true. So when- and in, consult in consultation, obviously, it doesn't take away the decision that has to be made by the commissioner himself or herself. So based on that protocol, would it be fair to say that your corporate counsel should have or did maybe speak with Mr. Sampson on the vote for the study that Port Authority paid $75,000 on behalf of the Rockefeller Group? I really don't have any idea. I don't know what happened there. Okay. Let me ask you about the, um, the New Jersey Transit lease. The New Jersey Transit lease. Okay. Did you vote on that? On that particular item, I don't think I did. I, I don't. I, I don't remember. I don't. I'd have to go look at the record again. I, I. There's so many different measures. I just don't know. Well, I mean, prior to this particular vote, the New Jersey Transit was paying nine hundred and ninety-nine thousand dollars to the Port Authority for rent for the North Bergen Park and Ride. Right. And it got changed to a dollar a year. So I would think that that would be something that would kind of stick out in memory. I, I just don't remember. I'm no. sorry, I don't. Okay, and would you happen to recall the vote on the uh, $256 million reconstruction project of the Harrison Path back in March of 2006? Um, 2006? 2012, Two I'm sorry. Oh, 2012. Um, that would be. I remember the project. Um, I I voted for it, but I, I don't rem I don't know what other people may have done. Do you recall if there was any discussion as to any members, specifically Mr. Sampson, recusing himself from it? Uh, I don't remember. Do you recall any discussion about Mr. Sampson recusing himself from the one dollar a year New Jersey Transit lease? I don't. Um, my understanding is that there's an investigation going on as to the funds being used for the for the Pulaski Skyway um, project. Um, have you received any information with regards to that? Have they contacted you or any of the commissioners concerning the Pulaski Skyway project and the use of Port Authority funds? Um, well, since I wasn't part of it, um, I haven't been, and I'm not aware of anybody else either. Well, you weren't part of the the vote at the time, but you're part of the commission now, correct? True. So that you would uh, and have I have been. That and I, I haven't been. Okay. Do you have any position, personal position, or opinion with regards to the Pulaski Skyway project being paid by the Port Authority? I don't. I, I don't. Uh, I mean, I, I happen to like Jersey projects, but I, I, I don't have a personal opinion since I didn't vote on that. Okay. You haven't seen any documentation, anything since? I have not. Okay. I have no further questions. Thank you. Assemblyman Moriarty and then Assemblyman Carroll, and hopefully we... Oh, and you have questions too? Okay, well, I don't know. I was hoping that we could get this finished and take the lunch break while we have executive session, but. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Oh, yeah. Good afternoon, Mr. Schubert. Good Welcome. afternoon. Thank you for appearing. You're welcome. Uh, can we go back to um, when you were selected to be on the Port Authority Commission? Who called you? Uh, Governor Christie. And what did he say? <laughs> um, he said, uh, Pat, would you like to serve the state of New Jersey? And um, 
I was in the middle of a class at the time, <laughs> and the students were looking at me. Um, and I, did, I, I, I was a little bit flabbergasted because I, I didn't know who was calling me, and I said, who's this? Um, having said that, regardless of the fact, um, I, I, I took it very seriously, and uh, he, he said that he wanted me to serve on the, on, he was interested in if I would serve on the authority. And aren't you happy that you did? <laughs> <laughs> I wish my cell phone had run out of a battery on that day, but having said that. Did you, um, uh, after that, um, I, I guess, did you say yes right away? Well, I, I, the answer is I got a second call with regard to it, and at that point I said yes. And did you ever discuss uh, the governor's expectations for your service on the commission? I, no, 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 I did not. No one ever gave you any briefing uh, as to how they would expect the New Jersey delegation to proceed? No. Were you told of any impending uh, toll hike? No, I was not. Boy, you were really thrown to the yeah. wolves. <laughs> so you, you get to the commission and you find out there's a, a toll hike in the works. You, you did not know any of this? No one from the administration briefed you on this? No. Okay. So I mean, the only briefing I had was the structure of the authority itself. Okay, so do you recall when you found out a toll hike was imminent? The first day I showed up. Nice. And did you communicate back to the governor's office? No, I did not. Did you have any regular communication with the governor's office as to what you should be doing at the Port Authority? I, I did not, no. So when this toll hike comes up, your testimony would be that the entire New Jersey delegation does not go back to the governor and talk to him about it? I, I have no idea what other commissioners did or did not do. I really don't know that. Um, many of them, obviously, they all had been there well before me. Um, and um, I, I, can't, I can't answer your question. I just don't know. I mean, this was a 75 to 100 percent increase. Do you know of any businesses that could increase their product by 75 to 100 percent and stay in business? Uh, I, well, I, I knew, as I said before when I testified on this, and I took this decision very, very seriously with regard to the fact of the, of the, of the um, facilities that we govern, um, that their upkeep and the safety of the people who use it is, is, is from uh, injury caused by a, a, a breakdown or um, of a, of, of, of a facility itself from a failure to repair it is something that haunts me. So, I mean, I, I, I took it seriously with regard to that, and that's how I viewed the, pro, the, the, the issue itself. Do you know what the annual revenue of the Port Authority or the daily revenue is of the Port Authority? I, I have those figures. I don't have them off the top of my head. I could certainly provide them. Seems like they must take in a lot of money each day. <laughs> well, the... Um, we would hope they do for the simple reason that uh, the facilities, uh, the things that we do are very, very important. Um, and as I said, toll revenue is, uh, is a good portion of our, uh, of our revenue stream beyond um, airport uh, facilities, parking, um, rentals, et cetera. Um, and it's almost like the tuition of the authority to a certain extent. And yet the debt is now somewhere around $20 billion? Approximately, yeah, about 19-something, I believe, when I last looked, uh, as far as that goes. Uh, it, quite frankly, the, the reason is obviously for capital planning, and, and, and that's part of the way that's done in, in the issue with regard to borrowing for the purpose of, of, of meeting our capital needs and, our, and other things along those lines. So, Seems like a lot of debt with all kinds of revenue coming in, uh, as you outline in your letter here, you know, the at this time, it was 2012, it said that the last five years gross compensation of Port Authority employees had grown almost 20 percent from 629 million to 749 million, and uh, employees' health benefits had increased 35 percent. So that was back in January 31st, 2012. Has that trend turned around since then? I'm sorry, could you read that again? I'm, I'm sorry, I lost the train on that. Gross compensation of the Port Authority has grown in the last five years by approximately 19 percent from 629 million to 749 million. And during the same time frame, the cost of benefits for employees increased by approximately 35 percent from 341 million to more than 458 million. 
This was in the letter that you signed on January 31st, 2012 to uh, Governor Christie and Governor Cuomo. Um, has it changed since then? Well, I think it, I, I would say this. The, 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 as I mentioned before, the um, census with regard to public employees at the authority has pretty well stayed the same. Um, we've added some police officers to try to get at the issue of overtime. Um, and our budget actually, as far as an increase, has really been within 1 to 1.1 percent each year with re regard to its increase. So I, I think from a holding the line, at least on our spending in that way, I think we've done the best, we've done a, a, a pretty good job, I think, in trying to, um, to maintain the fiscal uh, integrity of the authority itself. Would it be your testimony that you're not sure what the actual numbers are, whether it's gone up or down? I don't but, know the exact numbers as it relates to what you said there, because that letter, I think, is what, 2012? Right. I'm saying that since this letter was written, has that trend, because it went up almost 20 percent, has it gone down, stayed the same, continued to go up? I'd have to look at those. <coughs> Excuse me. I'd have to. <coughs> I'd have to go look at those, and, and, and I'd have to look at those numbers again to get the right ones for you. Would you provide that information subsequent to this hearing for me? I, yeah, I, I certainly have no problem with that. One of the, uh, one of the things uh, in this letter is that um, if, 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 I would ask if you would direct that to the authority, though, uh, for, the, for that purpose. Okay. Well, uh, and copy me. <laughs> or send it to me. Send it I'm to just me. asking. Yeah. You wrote the letter. It's your letter with your signature and three other people. So I'm just asking you if you could update those figures for me. I, sh I certainly will. Okay. And it also, uh, there was a recommendation to require contributions to health care for employees that would save $103.8 million over the course of the next four years. Uh, if you could implement that, has that happened? Yes, it has. Have you saved the, that kind of money? I'd have to look. Thank you so okay. much. Okay. Could you I'd provide me with that information yeah, yeah. as well? Yes. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Getting back to the toll hike, I, I have an article here that was in the Star Ledger by Steve Strunsky, March 2nd, 2014. The headline is Port Authority Officials, Battle Over Toll Hikes Was All For Show. Did you read that article? I did not, no, okay. sorry. Well, it says basically that um, the, um, the reporter says that he interviewed a uh, six former employees or officials who occupied key post port authority posts. I'm quoting from the article. Uh, the former port authority official tells the Star Ledger it was all bull. You can fill in the rest of it. From the start the fix was in, said the former official and five others who occupied key port authority posts when the toll hike was rolled out and eventually approved. The whole process, the authority official said, was orchestrated from the outset to make the governors look good even as they reached deeper through the long arm of the authority into the public's pockets. The former Port Authority officials, five who are no longer with the agency and one who is still there, outlined the strategy and execution of the plan in separate interviews with the Star Ledger. Each asked their names not be used because they feared, feared repercussions from speaking out even after they had left the agency. The first proposal disclosed to the public, the former official explained, was deliberately inflated also planned was Christie and Cuomo's shocked, shocked reaction and an unusual one-day series of eight public hearings. They knew that the toll, they knew what the toll increases would be, said one former official. They set the governors up to look like heroes. It was all a farce. Can you react to that? I haven't read the article and I'm not sure who, who they interviewed. I would say from my perspective, and I can't speak for any of the other commissioners, and I was coming on at that particular time. I had looked at, I'd been given the review by the CFO at the time. I had inspected facilities personally myself. I understood the importance of their upkeep and the development of the projects that were in keeping. I felt that the toll increase um, was um, a hard decision. I don't think it was an easy decision. I would have liked to have missed the meeting. Sure. No, I understand. Uh, but I believe that it was the right thing to do, and that's personally how I felt with regard to it. I have no understanding of what is in that article, um, and I didn't play a part with that. You know nothing about any kind of orchestrated. I do not. Hike. I mean, I, I know, I know what I felt. I only know what I felt and how I, I reacted <laughs> to the situation and what I was going to do. Were you aware that there was any kind of campaign-style operation put together to? 
announce the toll hikes, to promote the toll hikes, to create a, a reason for the toll hikes? Do you know of anything like that? No, I do not. March 2nd, 2014, Bergen Record reported on the toll increases process and specifically the, quote, campaign developed to announce the toll hikes and give the governors an opportunity to lower and final toll increases. According to the press reports, the campaign style operation was run out of an office on the 15th floor of Manhattan headquarters. Were you aware of that no, I campaign? No, I was not. According to the article, only about 15 people were allowed into the room where the toll increase plan was being developed. Did you ever enter that room, or do you know anything about that? I have no so idea. Room? I, I wouldn't even know where it is. I, I don't know. <laughs> did you? Uh, <clears throat> do you? Did you speak to Bill Baroni about the toll increase plan? I, I don't recollect. So I, I just don't remember. Did you speak to David Wildstein about the toll increase plan? No, I did not. Did you, so you ne and did you speak to anyone at the governor's office about the toll increase? No, plan? I spoke to no one in the governor's office about it. No. Did anyone from the governor's office speak to you or through any intermediaries to tell you that it would be a good idea to vote for that? No. And to be, see, I have a, I'm a little confused here because the governor was shocked. You're, you're, you're serving at the pleasure of the governor. You're a fiscal conservative. Wouldn't you have reached out to find out, well, you know, am I doing the right thing here, agreeing I, that we I, should go forward? I'm sorry. I, I, I didn't talk to anybody with regard to it, and, 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 and I voted for it. Um, I, every time a matter comes up, I, I'm not going to call the governor's office to find out whether I should vote for it or not. Um, well, it's, it, this isn't a, a minor matter. We're talking it's about not a, a minor toll matter. hike of 75 to 100 percent. That was the original one before the, it came down. Uh, I mean, it's going to affect lots and lots and lots of people. That's an expensive toll hike. It's not a small matter. It's not like you're calling up to find out, you know, wh whether uh, they should hire um, a, a new engineer or something. No, I understand that, and I, I don't treat it that way either. Um, I, 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 look, I, as I, I've indicated already, I, it was a tough decision to make. I, I believe that I did the right thing based on the information that I had been given with regard to it. Um, I, I do recognize this, though, that two things: one, the process in making that happen has changed and been implemented by the authority for if it's necessary for any time in the future, and I hope it isn't. Um, second, I think that there, I, I do think this, I think that there is a, um, uh, a limit to what you can charge with regard to people in this economy using uh, those types of public facilities. I am cognizant of that. Um, and, you know, and, and particularly as we go forth, we need to continue to make sure they keep that in mind. But there were, your testimony would be that there's, there's never been any coordination between what you do as a commissioner and what the governor's office, the administration, would like you to do. No, I didn't say that. Okay. I, 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 I think I've asked you several times if you ever talked to the governor's office I did not, about no, anything. I did, and the answer to your question each time, and it still is, is no, I did not. Okay, so I thought you just changed your... No, I did not. I okay. said, you said, you said, well, I, I, Maybe you should repeat it yourself, but um, I, I thought you said in, in ever, uh, you know, does the governor's feelings with regard to um, issues with regard to things, uh, do you get feedback with regard to it? I think that's what you asked. Okay, and you do, you're saying? Periodically, yeah. Okay. Sure. You would want to. That's, that's why I, I find it strange that there was no interaction on this toll increase, but so what types of issues have you uh, had interaction or uh, coordinated efforts? Usually it's an issue that in, in impacts uh, a project in the state of New Jersey of, of major import, like the Bayonne Bridge, for example, or um, the Gothels Bridge. And would that um, communication come from the gover governor himself? Would he pick up the phone and no, talk to you? No, it does not. Who would, who would be the person Usually that would contact you? Usually it would come you? through the, um, uh, the deputy executive director. Of the Port Authority? Yes. So you wouldn't speak to the administration in Trent? No. Okay. You would be informed from the deputy executive director what he had heard through 
talking directly with the administration? I, I, or you don't know? I don't know how that, that works. I really don't. Okay. Um, by the way, do you know what, what, what was David Wallstein's job? Do you know? It, it, uh, as far as I know, he was the deputy to Bill Baroni. Do you know what he did? Well, policy issues, you know, with regard to, as any of the staffers do, monitoring the committees and things along those lines. Do you have any staffers? No, we don't. Okay, do you have an office? No, we don't. Okay, you just show up for the meetings? Yeah, we don't even have an office in the building either. Okay. So they give you a packet of information when a board meeting is coming up and brief you? Yes. Who, who briefs you? Uh, the deputy executive director. Is that by phone? Or do you caucus? Uh, we caucus periodically. Sometimes it was done by phone, sometimes we caucus. You know, back in, when, this, uh, when Bill Baroni was saying that this was a traffic study, what did you think of his claim that it was a traffic study? Uh, look, I had a great respect for Bill Baroni. Um, you know, as far as, as his work was, I had no reason to question him with regard to that. I mean, he, he was always a, you know, a, a valuable staffer, I thought. Did you do anything to try to investigate whether the bridge, clo bridge lane closures was uh, proper? No. Did you ask anyone at the Centura Commissioner, you're one of 12, did you ask anyone to look into these allegations? I did not. And, I, and I've indicated, uh, you know, my reasons for that. But, I mean, you're a lawyer, right? I mean, what, you're a lawyer, is that correct? Yeah. Okay. Do you, don't you get a little nervous when people claim that laws might have been broken and it's on, and you're one of the commissioners? <clears throat> I think that, uh, you know, is. is Quite frankly, as a part-time official, you, know, you rely on your staff to, to do the right thing, and that's, that's personally how I felt about it. I want to switch gears to the Pulaski Skyway again sure. uh, that uh, Assemblywoman previously talked about. Are, are you aware of any investigation or inquiries by any government agency, SEC, Manhattan DA, anyone, uh, looking into the propriety, propriety of moving the money from the Port Authority to New Jersey to fund the Pulaski Skyway. Other than what he might have read in a newspaper? Yes. Okay. No. I'm only familiar with what I saw in the paper. Okay. So what would be the, as a commissioner, when are you notified of, let's say, a lawsuit or any legal inquiries, what would be the normal course of, uh, of notification? Counsel, and normally, counsel would send, you a, uh, would send out a blast email or a memo to the commissioners with regard to that. Is that only when there's an actual lawsuit filed? We, uh, on lawsuits, we, we get a periodic update on the lawsuits that have been filed. Um, and, and every lawsuit that's filed, quite frankly, we don't necessarily get individually, but rather in the, cor in the, in the course of um, uh, the uh, periodic reports, unless it was like the one that As Assemblywoman Hanlon asked me about, which was Jersey Cities, which, because it was the, a huge amount, we, we were notified of that. Um, so, um, uh, no, uh, you know, we haven't. And I, I actually, only, I mean, I was not familiar with the Pulaski uh, Skyway issue because I wasn't here at the time. And I, uh, I mean, the only extent I have any information on it is because I've read an article in the newspaper about it. When you've read that article and it's about an agency that you are on the board, um, did you call anyone to say, hey, we got a problem here? No, I did not. Why? Well, first of all, <laughs> why? I, I wasn't here at the time that it was done. Um, and I'm not going to, you know, just run to do something based on just one newspaper article that I happened to read. Oh, I didn't ask you to run to do anything except to ask. I did, and the answer to your question is I did not. Okay, so you don't, you have not reviewed the issue, you don't know, it's your testimony that you, you're not even sure whether the Pulaski Skyway is an access road to the Lincoln Tunnel. 
I, I, Although not, a look at a map and a drive would tell you it isn't. Well, I, I, I understand that from your perspective, but no, I, I do not. Thank you for your testimony. You're, you're welcome. Thank you. I don't know how long your questioning is. It's 25 to 2. Assemblyman Carroll, do you? I'm sorry. Go ahead. Good. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. I appreciate it. Commissioner, thank you for coming today. Uh, just a couple of questions, uh, follow up to some, some of the other things. Uh, if I read what you were saying, read between the lines of what you're saying, had you been around in the 1970s, you might not have voted for the World Trade Center. And uh, I'm not going to ask you to opine on that. I'm just going to simply say it appears to have been a consistent money loser. And according to what I read in Bloomberg not, le not more than three days ago, it appears that it may still be a money loser. Uh, I understand that rents have been cut by 10 percent in some areas there. What is being done to staunch the bleeding? Uh, that's a good question, uh, Simon. Thank you. Um, the, um, we could speculate for years on, uh, on you know, the, what should have gone on there, but uh, in the, in back, way back in the 70s. However, rather, uh, right now what we're trying to, we have a, a, a professional organization that's um, seeking tenants with regard to it. Um, we have a, um, a state-of-the-art um, facility on, I think it's the, on the, near the top with regard to uh, observation. Uh, we're doing everything to make it safe, secure, and desirable for tenants to be a part of. Um, we're starting to see a little bit of loosening with regard to that. Yes, they did, lo loose, they did uh, reduce the rent a bit to, to attract more tenants with regard to it. And quite frankly, it's one of the reasons I'm, I'm, I'm not supportive of the Silverstein application at this time only because it looks like it runs in competition with us there uh, on that, and I don't see the purpose for that. Well, what about the possibility of privatizing it? Well, in many ways, it, it's, it's partially privatized now, quite frankly. I mean, there's, there's going to be, uh, um, you know, there's a, there's a kind of an, under, there's an underground mall with regard to it through Westfield. Um, the... Um, as, as, as it relates to that, um, I'd have to take a look at the issue of what that, the impact of that would be to the authority with regard to privatization. Okay, now again, I, I think Assemblyman Carita came up with, it was talking about the grant to the Rockefeller Group, but it wasn't to the Rockefeller Group, it was actually to the city of Hoboken to do a, what amounts to a master plan study. What possible rationale exists for the uh, Port Authority to be handing out money to local municipalities to do zoning studies? Um, I don't, I don't, quite frankly, I, I am not familiar with this issue and I don't know the answer to your question. Okay. Um, if I may interrupt on it, just sure. because you I'm started sorry. out with, by talking about the Port Authority's mission. And uh, if the mission is economic development, that's like the Commerce Clause. Everything right. qualifies. Right. Uh, you become basically a super entity without limitation on what it is you can and can in fact do. Uh, you also pointed out that Kennedy Airport is regard, regarded over across the world as something of a, an eyesore and a disaster. Uh, would it not be more appropriate for the Port Authority to channel its resources into making sure that's not the case than giving out goodies to local municipalities? And if that's a leading question, I apologize, because <laughs> it's meant to be. No, I understand it is. Um, <laughs> I don't know the, how to answer the question. Um, obviously, I think, obviously, we, should, we need to do everything we can to, to um, enhance the usability of, of uh, 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 the enhanced the desirability of the usability of JFK. Um, or all the facilities. And all of our facilities. And part of the problem with JFK is not the facilities themselves, but the access to the facilities right. and the terrible traffic in the area, quite frankly. It's not necessarily the facilities themselves. And I didn't necessarily mean to, to, to let that on. But um, the, um, uh, <laughs> Look, I, I think what, what I think we need to do is continue, is more towards our core mission going forward now with the, with the trade towers, the trade tower and the facilities almost now completed. The museum is, is, is open. The, the memorial site is now open to the public as a regular basis. The transportation hub is coming on. Um, I think it's important for us now to move ahead into the things that are more closely related to our core mission for me, one of those things would be the Port Authority bus terminal at 42nd okay. Street um, and things along those lines are, that are more towards the things that we traditionally have done. Well, if I may, I, I read through part, most of that uh, Empire on the Hudson, which is interesting history. I'm sure you've right. read it. Yes. Uh, 
it seems to me back in the day that mm -hmm. the, there, there were the Robert Moseses of this world, et cetera, and, and these people had a vision of what they wanted to see. Uh, with a massive turnover of the leadership at the Port Authority, is there any one or any group that has a vision as to what you want the Port Authority to look like 5, 10, 15, 20 years down the line, and how are you going to pay for it? Well, uh, that's a good question, and I think that um, one of the things that occurred to me when we had our, our oversight meeting where we brought in uh, Professor Deutsch, who wrote the book, as well as others, um, and talked about that issue, about the vision for the future, I thought that after when, we, when the reform issue is, is resolved and, and moved forward, that we need to do more of that for ourselves intellectually to, to, to clarify the vision of the future for the Port of Authority of New York and New Jersey. That requires, I think, several things that we don't do now. For example, I've advocated that the commissioners need to go on retreat, beyond the political retreat, but retreat uh, with regard to the issue of, of just getting uh, understanding what we do and, and what we need to do for the future, which we don't do because we come in together for a committee meeting or we come in on once a month or whatever the case may be uh, on that. We just don't collectively come together for that purpose. So that would be another aspect of that. Um, well, maybe instead of retreating, you should surrender. Because, I mean, <laughs> you know, we're looking at this, if I, if I may, again, I'm, I'm looking at the Bloomberg story, and it's, apparently you're running a $1.2 billion operating loss on various and sundry entities that the Port Authority makes up, uh, while you're only spending $287 million on the capital project. <coughs> and that strikes me as being backwards. I mean, you've got a big problem there. What's being done to make sure that that operating expense ceases to exist? Well, or actually, I, lost. Yeah. Um, well, I, I think that the finance committee, as reconstituted, that's chairs by um, a former colleague, uh, Assemblyman Bagger, uh, uh, Commissioner Nan Bagger, um, has really gotten a, a real handle. He's got with, lots of titles, actually. I'm sorry. He had lots of titles. Yes. <laughs> and I uh, and had um, as we're getting a, a, a really good fiscal handle with regard to the authority and keeping right, riding rain on its expenses as well as allocating the capital plan appropriately to the areas that we need to do and on a regular basis, and also dealing with the issue of, a, of its insurance and its insurance costs. And we made, uh, I think, significant progress with regard to that. It's, a, it's an issue for us that is uh, very much in our minds um, and uh, continues to um, occupy a tremendous amount of our time with regard to that committee. Coming back to something uh, something Moriarty was talking about a minute ago about the labor costs and such. Again, in that same Bloomberg article, they reported uh, the massive overtime costs. And that's been a long-standing yes, problem. Yes, it is. At, at, I, mean, I, I remember when I first got involved, you know, cops making $284,000 a year because of overtime. And I read that a, uh, one particular employee, and I gather he's a police officer, made $331,000 last year because of overtime. That's a lot of her schnagels. And, uh, you know, what is being done? I mean, I know you hired more police officers. I know your security costs have more than tripled. And, and for some reason, there's, there's certainly an aspect which is warranted given circumstances. But what's being done to make sure that those, what I would call, labor abuse is stopped? The, um, we actually are starting to see some good news with regard to overtime. Um, the, uh, some of the areas that we're looking at over time seems to be stabilizing. Um, law enforcement issues, given the nature of the things that, that are going on with the port, are, are, are a challenge with regard to that. We're hoping that the, the, new, police, the new police class will help us to address that. Um, our security officer and, and basically head of our public safety entity, uh, Joseph Dunn, understands that's a number one priority beyond the safety of, our, of the public and our facilities. And um, we're starting to see a little bit of a leveling of that. Um, this last year has been tough. I mean, the last two years have been tough between Sandy, the Super Bowl, and other issues that required, and the bad winter. Um, the overtime with regard to our employees on that, you know, just as a, as a figure that is related to those activities that hopefully we don't, well, well, it depends how you feel about the Super Bowl, but we don't see again. I'm a Rangers fan. I don't care. <laughs> but, well, good luck. I hope it works yeah. out. I, I mean, I'd like, you know, Mr. Chairman, I want to thank you very much for the, the opportunity. I'd like, you know, again, it's been a long day. Uh, I'd like to go further on that stuff, but I'm going to Stop for the time Thank being because you, of time. Thank uh, you, Assemblyman Carroll. Assemblywoman Chapisi, if you, and then we can close it. Go ahead.
Um, there were quite a few references to uh, Senator Weinberg's letter of September 19th. If you have it in front of you, would you just take a quick look at it to refresh your recollection? <laughs> Is there any reference within that letter? Do you have it in front of you? I do. To public safety issues? The word is not used, no. Okay, I, I just want to clarify because that was utilized quite a bit, um, not by you, but earlier in questioning. And with respect to the letter, I did not see that in there. Notwithstanding that, um, once you had heard that this letter existed, you and Senator Weinberg had communication on or about September 25th, correct? Uh, uh, approximately, yeah, okay. yes. Um, bringing you to your phone log, which I believe is tab number, tab number five. Right. According to the phone log, you had a conversation with Senator Weinberg at approximately 11.13 a.m. on September 25th, correct? Right. And that conversation lasted about six minutes? Right. And on the same date at 11.20, approximately a minute after you got off the phone with Senator Weinberg, you reached out to Mayor Sokolich, correct? That's correct, yes. And according to that log, it was about two minutes with, on the same date at 12.09, um, you received a phone call back from Mayor Sokolich that lasted about 22 minutes, is that correct? That's correct. Okay, during that 22-minute call with Mayor Sokolich, to the best of your recollection, what was discussed? Uh, to the best of my recollection, um, the first things we talked about were an ICL course that was coming up. Um, the second thing, I told him that I was calling at the request of Senator Weinberg, who had asked me to call him, um, about the uh, traffic issues that, that had occurred up at the, up at the bridge. Um, he had indicated to me um, that, um, he was concerned with regard to that. Um, I had asked him if he had talked to anybody at the port. Um, he said that he was trying to get a meeting with regard to that with Mr. Baroni, and that uh, the meeting was had it was scheduled some time in the distance. And I asked him if I could if I could an, uh, expedite that meeting for him. Um, and he said no, no, he didn't want to. He wanted. I think he indicated he wanted to continue to maintain good relations with the port. Uh, I, I gave him. I said, do you have my cell phone number? And I gave him my cell phone number for any future reference and said that I was concerned that my concern was that, um, that I wanted to make sure that he got, that he personally and his official staff like the police, et cetera, would get notification of any other type of actions at the bridge itself. During this conversation, do you recall the mayor ever expressing a concern that he believed that um, what occurred with the traffic in the bridge was political retaliation against him by the governor? I don't remember him saying those words, but he did say that there was a lot of press interest with regard to that issue. Did you have any subsequent conversations with the mayor after the September uh, I did not, no. Um, with respect to the letter itself, it was also cc'd to a couple of other people, including um, Assemblyman Gordon Johnson, Assemblywoman Huddle, did anybody else reach out to you on this issue um, after the letter was sent? Um, I, I, I'll be honest, I just don't remember. Last question or two. Um, we have discussed over the past several months potential reforms to the Port sure. Authority. Uh, you yourself today have testified on certain things that you'd like to see, including preventing political donations from commissioners, having um, potentially a sign-off by both governors or the legislative bodies um, for director-level type employees with nationwide uh, searches. 
Based upon your position as a commissioner, based upon what you've seen occur thus far, do you see any reason for us not to start moving forward on reforms? I, I, I don't, having been a legislator, I am reluctant to intervene and say you should move forward right now with this. I, I, it's not my purpose, but I would just say, yes, I think it's, a, it's, it's time now to move reforms forward. I, I do believe that, um, and it, the time is ripe. Um, it's apropos, uh, given the situation, and the fact that there are, it appears to be, at least collegially or collaboratively, um, New York legislators in similar committees on the other side of the river doing the same thing, which is unique, in my opinion, in dealing with the Port Authority, and I think you should take advantage of that. Um, and and go f and go for and go forward. I do. Okay. Last question. Uh, we were talking about uh, some of the recusal provisions that have been put in place. Right. Um, if you had a commissioner who was a partner at a law firm which was doing a real estate transaction um, involving the Port Authority, they would have to recuse themselves. Correct. Correct. Uh, if you had a partner who. Um, was a commissioner who was involved in an act of litigation against the Port Authority, you would recuse yourself, correct? Right. Okay. Um, and these are all standard operating procedures that are now in place at the Port Authority? Yeah, they, those would be, in my mind, would be uh, conflicts of interest, yes. Okay. No further questions. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Uh, thank you. And uh, just before I close, I have two questions. Uh, as the former Bergen County executive, I know you know Bergen County quite well. Did you listen to Bill Baroni's testimony before the Assembly Transportation Committee? I, 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 unfortunately, I did not. I'm sorry. Did you read about it? I read about it. Okay. Are you aware that there, that Bill Baroni testified to the fact that this was this tra so-called traffic study? was done because there are these private dedicated lanes from Fort Lee for Fort Lee residents? I, I was not, no, I'm sorry. So you weren't aware that Bill Brony testified to that? I was not, there no. There were subsequent op-ed pieces and speeches made about that? I, I, I. Where the governor's office, the governor himself commented on it? Um, I'm not, I'm sorry. Okay, my last uh, question then. Um, will you recall when you were nominated, and I think at the three or four hours ago, <clears throat> I talked about my feelings about when you were nominated and uh, that I was planning to vote for you. Do you recall any of those conversations? I do. And what do you recall about that? I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't hear what you said. You, you, did, you do not recall it. No, I do. Okay, then what do you recall? I recall what you just said. Okay. And do you recall that when you appeared before the Judiciary Committee, I again, in the spirit of bipartisanship, and because of my respect for you, that I again reiterated that I was delighted to vote for you because I knew how well you knew Bergen County and how the Port Authority impacts Bergen County for all the obvious reasons. Do you recall that? Um, I, yes, I do. Okay. And do you recall, uh, although our recollections of that phone conversation seem to be slightly different, but that is what it is, do you recall that on at least three public occasions, and then once or twice when I bumped into you along the road, that I referred to that conversation and said that you had said to me you were going to check into this and get back to me. Did you ever correct that impression, either publicly or privately, to me? I don't, I, okay. I don't remember. I, I actually don't remember that last part, but I, I did not, no. You don't remember my speaking before the Port Authority? Oh, I do. I do remember that, and yes. And my referring specifically to our phone conversation? I don't remember Publicly. that. Publicly? No. You don't recall that? I do not. And you don't recall when we met each other along the 
road. I remember us. meeting you at the debate. And that I again approached you about that phone conversation. Do you um, recall I, that? I don't recall you saying that. No, I do okay. not. Okay. I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. uh, we have no further questions. We need to move to release the documents. Madam. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't see the first sentence. Assemblyman Wisniewski. Just one, one brief follow-up. Um, I think in questioning, responding to questioning, it might have been by Assemblyman Moriarty, but clearly I know Senator Gill asked questions about the September 13th Pat Foy email. Do right. you recall that inquiry? I do. Um, your testimony was that you did not receive a copy of this email. No, I, don't, I didn't say I didn't receive it. I, I didn't remember whether I had read it or not at that point. Okay. When did you read it? Um, subsequent to that. Okay. And I don't remember when, I'll be honest with you. Okay. Um, when did you first become aware that Pat Foy had raised his concerns in the form of an email? Uh, I don't remember. Not at all? I do not. No, I do not. When did you first become aware that there was a question about lanes being closed on the George Washington Bridge? Uh, when I read a newspaper article around the, the 20th or 19th or the 20th of September. Of September? Yeah. Um, when was the next Port Authority Commissioner meeting after that? I'd have to look. I, I don't know. I don't know, if there was, I don't know if there was one in September or the next one would have been in October. I don't remember. I know I attended one in November. Yeah. No, I, I realize you were in November, but there was, the next one might have been October. I just don't remember. Would it be fair to say that by the November meeting you were aware of the Pat Foy email? I, 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 I'm, I don't want to speculate. I, I, I would assume so. When you became aware of the Pat Foy email, which raised, among other things, uh, an allegation by Pat Foy that laws may have been broken, uh, did you then contact Mr. Bookbinder, the authority's counsel, and ask him, what should I do with this? Okay. Excuse us, please. I think that, they, uh, first of all, I, uh, with regard to any conversation with Mr. Bookbinder, I think those might be privileged. But I'm not asking you to I describe did not. No, I did the not. conversation. I'm asking you, did you at some point in time contact Mr. Bookbinder and say, what should we do about this? Well, you characterized the conversation, sir. Did you ask Mr. Bookbinder a question about what you had been made aware of? I did not. At no time? No. Okay. At any point in time, did you raise it to your fellow commissioners? I did not, no. Um, after uh, the revelations of January of 2014, did you raise this issue with Mr. Bookbinder? I did not, and shortly thereafter it went to the Inspector General. Uh, at any time after those revelations of January of 2014, did you raise it to your fellow commissioners? No. Okay. My concluding question is, do you believe in your failure to raise these issues that you fulfilled your fiduciary responsibility to the Port Authority? I, I believe that the answer to your question is yes, I do. I believe that I've served the, the, the commission or the Port Authority Commission um, professionally and ably with regard to it. Could I do better? Sure, I could. Anybody could with regard to it. And hindsight is 2020. But I, I as fulfilling my fiduciary duty to the uh, to the as a commissioner, I believe I have. <coughs> so you never once raised this issue with either Mr. Bookbinder or your fellow commissioners? I did not. Thank you. Uh, thank you. One final comment or question each from Assemblywoman Huddle? No? Senator Gill. Just one question. Did you or any commissioner <coughs> at any point ask why was there a lane closure on September the 11th? <coughs> I, I can't answer. I, I can't speak for anybody else. Okay, so I'm asking. It, I did not. <coughs> did any? And, and, and the reason I'm asking you this is because even if you assumed it was e a valid um, traffic study, even if we assume that, right, for the purpose of argument, it seems to me a logical question would be: <coughs> But why would you close the lanes? on September 11th, which is the height 
of national security uh, in issues of national security and terrorism in our country, why would we, why would the port uh, have lane closures on September the 11th? I think that I, I can't answer your question with regard to um, the, that particular issue as it relates to September the 11th. I can't. I don't know the answer to it. But, uh, you know, again, from my perspective as a commissioner, um, my perspective with regard to the, the, the staff of the authority and, and how it ran was run, we, is you depend upon. And I thought they, had, they ran it professionally with regard to it. And I took that, I took that as part of the, my feeling about how the, the authority runs. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, thanks for the interesting, uh, well, first of all, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, Schuber, it, you were quite correct. You are the first Port Authority Commissioner that we have had <coughs> the opportunity to question about a number of issues, and I think you gave us an insight, pretty clear insight, perhaps, into the Port Authority. But, and we appreciate your being here. We appreciate your attorney being here. Uh, we need to just do two follow-up resolutions. We need to move to release the documents. Madam Co-Chair, I'll make a motion that all the documents submitted today, June 3rd, June 3rd, 2014, by the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey on behalf of William Pat Schuber to New Jersey Legislative Select Committee on Investigation and any other exhibits on which William Pat Schuber was questioned here today be made part of the official public record and attached to the official transcript of today's meeting. I make that motion. Second. Second. Can roll. Well, wait a minute. A wait. question from uh, Assemblywoman Hanlon. I just wanted to make sure that would include the exhibit to the lawsuit that I shared with everyone. Wait, that that, that was distributed, yes. Okay, good. So that will be part of the you have a comment? Correct. I do have a comment. I, I, I think that uh, what we were talking about, Assemblywoman, was the documents that were submitted in response to the subpoena as well as the documents that were used today. Is that correct? Yes. That is correct. I amend the motion. May I have a roll call, please? On the motion that all documents submitted by the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey on behalf of William Pat Schuber to the New Jersey Legislative Select Committee on Investigation and any other exhibits on which William Pat Schuber was questioned here today be made part of the official public record and attached to the official transcript of today's meeting. Senator O'Toole. Yes. Assemblywoman Schapese. Assemblywoman Hanlon. Assemblywoman Veneri Huddle. Yes. Assemblyman Moriarty. Yes. Senator Gill. Yes. Assemblywoman Caride. Yes. Co Chair Wisniewski. Yes. Co Chair Weinberg. Yes. <clears throat> and now we need to move to go into executive session and lunch. <laughs> Can I have a motion? Roll call. On the motion that the, com the committee convene in closed session to receive the advice of special counsel, Assemblywoman Shapizi, yes. Senator O'Toole, yes. Assemblywoman Hanlon, Assemblywoman Hanlon, yes. Assemblywoman Veneri Huddle, yes. Assemblyman Moriarty, yes. Senator Gill, yes. Assemblywoman Caride, yes. Co Chair Wisniewski. Yes. Co-Chair Weinberg. Yes.